late, I'm late, I'm late. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, so sorry about that. <laughs> My mom called me. Oh, hi, Flix. How are you? Oh, this this OST is actually from Magna Carta 2. It's an old Xbox 360 video game. It's actually one of my favorites. Okay. So actually, let me put on some. Non stressful music. <laughs> Time to speed run. <laughs> I've actually never done the speed run before. I should try that. I think I'd fail, but whatever. <laughs> um, where's my playlist? I had all this set up last night. This is what happens when your computer updates. Uh, here we go. Jesus. Okay. Hi! Alrighty. So today we are reading Passerine. On oh, my school project? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, face cam, but still, still anonymous. Haha, <laughs> mask. Anyway, um,. My school project, my senior project, went really well. I did end up graduating. Wait. Headphones are in the way. I'm like trying to see how I can do this without exposing myself. The, yeah, this is a copy of my degree. Okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I worked hard. I have, an, I have a better one. It's downstairs, though, but, uh, you know, I'm already starting late, so I can't run down there and get it. Oh, my God. Go back in the folder. Okay. So, Passerine! Yay! This fanfic has been making the rounds on Minecraft Twitter? Like, it's... So many people have been talking about it. I've been talking about it with a lot of people on Instagram. So, I really, really wanted to go ahead and try to... Um... I, I don't know, just, just read it. Because Sadist actually made an animatic for it. So, that's that's exciting. Yeah, you can't wait to um, watch that. That's definitely a reason why I'm, I want to catch up and know what the heck is even going on in this. So, um, you see the rating up here. Okay. Um, if you're not in that category, sorry. 
Uh, there is major character death. Someone did tell me that. And graphic depictions of violence. You know, the yada yada. You know how this thing goes if you read fan fiction. Uh, this is SBI centric. Sleepy Boys Inc. You know, Phil, Techno, Will, and Tommy. And yes, this is an alternate universe. Oh, and it's actually found family. Okay. Nice. All right. So if you read fan fictions, you know how this goes. Uh, the Passerine by... I'm just going to say Blue Jamas because I don't know how to pronounce this. Oh, God, no. Okay. All right. Let me get my, my reading voice on. I hope the music isn't too loud, too, because I can lower that if need be. Okay, awesome. All right, summary. I understand you heard the place you left was in trouble, so you came back, but I don't... I just... Why didn't you take me? Here it was, at last. Catharsis. A something... Or something close to it. I would have hunted them down for you, Filza. The people who did that to your town. I would have given you your vengeance on a silver platter. I would have given you the world. Filza didn't look guilty. He just looked tired. I didn't hunt them down, though. Or that fic where Techno and Phil are old immortals and Tommy and Will are decidedly not. <laughs> okay, so already. Already we know. Angst. Angst is going to ensue. Chapter 1 Like a fox, like an eagle to an airy. Okay. The voices led him to kingdom, kingdoms and shi shires and towns. It didn't matter what they offered him in return. The voices didn't demand coin. They demanded blood. He fought for bold men and stupid men, greedy kings and starry-eyed rebels. He fought for armies, doomed to fail, and dragged them into the light of glory. He had lost count of how many allies he'd fought beside. After a time, their names and faces had faded into the, to the recesses of his hazy memory. And then, there was the Angel of Death. Or, Eternity Empires and the Emperors that rule them. Let me move the stream so I can make sure that the words are actually visible. Okay. Okay, I think that's better. He must have had a life before this. A mother, a father, a home, maybe sisters or brothers. But it had been so long, too long, and now all he knew was this bloody game. His hands knew no shape than fists curled tightly around a sword, swinging eternally, finding its mark through skin and bone. They all tried to run, of course. They built walls and cowered in corners, but he always found them. Sometimes they begged. Sometimes they chose to jump from cliffs rather than face his reckoning, and sometimes they stared back at him with eyes as empty as his own and welcomed death with open arms. Those were the ones he envied the most. Technoblade never dies, they whispered around campfires and funeral pyres. He prayed that that wasn't true. The voices led him to kingdoms and shires and towns, and didn't matter what they offered him in return. The voices didn't demand coin. They demanded blood. He fought for bold men and stupid men, greedy kings and starry-eyed rebels. He fought for armies doomed to fail and dragged them to the light of glory. He had lost count of how many allies he'd fought beside. After a time, their names and faces had faded into the recesses of his hazy memory. And then there was the Angel of Death. He was the one of the very few people with a reputation that matched Technoblades. He'd heard of the angel through whispered stories and snatched of, and snatches of tavern 
gossip. I heard he has obsidian wings, one patron would say to another over a cup of ale. I heard he once massacred an entire army all by himself. He makes even the green god afraid. Technoblade had begun to imagine a ruthless man, an immortal butcher with the same wretched grin as him. But Filza was not an avenging angel. He was just Filza. They'd met by coincidence. Oh, wait, sorry. They'd met by coincidence. Shoot, where did I... Oh. They'd met by coincidence in a land of ice and snow. It was barren, but they'd made quick work of it together. First as allies, and then as friends. Through it all, Felza had smiled instead of grinned. Laughed instead of cackled. On calmer days, they'd while away time. And... They'd while away time with tea and chess and silent meditations that quieted the screaming in Techno's head, if only for a little while. You know, Techno had said during one of their sparring matches, they had lived, they had stayed, they had to stay in shape, of course, because peace times never lasted as long as people hoped. The stories never talked about this side of you. Phil's had paused, a smile amused on his face. Oh? He said. What do the stories talk about then? They call you the Angel of Death. Techno dug his heels in as Filza resumed an onslaught of blows with his dulled sword. They said you leave a path of destruction in your wake that nothing. Ha! Techno parried and went on the offensive. That nothing is sacred to you. Their blades met. They pushed against each other, trying to gain an upper hand, and it was only because they were standing so close that Techno noticed the shift in Filza's eyes. A momentary coldness that was brutal as the blizzard raging outside. It was there, and gone in an instant. Light returned, and Filza laughed as he pushed back against Techno's sword. Stories are curious. Stories are curious things, Filza said as he swung again, barely giving Techno time to dodge. Some of them are true. He moved so quickly, te Techno could do nothing but stand there as Filza rushed him with a hilt to the ribs, knocking Techno backwards onto the training room floor. Techno scrambled to his knees, but Filza was already standing over him with his sword held high above his head, his eyes glimmering with an emotion Techno couldn't place. For once in his immortal life, kneeling there in front of his first person he called friend, Technoblade felt hunted. And then Filza lowered his weapon. He smiled gently down at Techno, the soft smile Techno was used to, and offered Techno a gloved hand. And some of them are not, Filza finished. So, best of two out of three? You're a bastard, Techno said playfully, even as the voices screamed, run, run, run. He took Filza's offered hand and pulled himself up beside the man that he was sure could have cut him in two, no matter how dull the sword's edge was. As Filza patiently moved Techno through all the things he'd done wrong, small things like foot placement and his hilt grip being an inch off, Techno found it equal parts amusing and frightening that despite his eons of bloody fighting, it took only a few minutes of sparring for Filza to find flaws in his technique. But then again, Techno's technique wasn't particularly polished. It took only one brutal swing to fell most people. Something told him that Filza would be harder to kill than that. They conquered nations, he and his golden-haired friend. They were bathed in glory, twin gods shining in the middle of a bloody field. But as their empire grew, so did their enemies. They came in droves, day after day, and before long, Techno had forgotten what peace tasted like. The days were long, and the nights were longer. Every flicker of movement was a spy in the shadows. Every ally was a potential traitor. Every word was a declaration of war. Their home had become a target for a thousand's army. For a thousand armies. Through it all, his one constant was Phil, until he wasn't. Technoblade simply looked up one day from a, from a map detailing 
enemy lines and realized he'd been talking to empty air. He had no idea how long he'd been alone, sitting in a dusty library with stale tea untouched in the corner. He had no idea if Phil ever said he was leaving, or if he simply went as he arrived suddenly, swiftly, like a snowstorm. Afterwards, there was hardly any point in maintaining the Empire. The voices were getting bored anyway. They wanted fresh blood. They wanted more stories. So Techno took his sword and his shield and abandoned ship. He'd done it a million times before, but the thought of a chessboard lying unused in a crumbling castle made him feeling something close to regret. Technoblade wandered the world, quenching his thirst, trying to appease the voices. Neither of them were ever satisfied. No matter how much chaos he dealt, there was always more work to be done. So he worked. He had no idea for how long. All he remembered from that bloody time was a sense of unfulfillment, like a story had been left unfinished halfway through. Years. Decades. Maybe more. It hardly mattered. In the end, he knew it would all be the same. The world would end, and he would remain. Always fighting. Always alone. Dang, that's sad. <laughs> oh my god. Like, wow. Oh my gosh, this is so sad. Okay. Whew, I gotta prepare myself for the next one. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I'm looking like I'm looking down at my phone because my friend is texting me. I need to manage my dashboard because I cannot see my chat. Okay. On with the story. He didn't know what brought him to the kingdom in the first place. Did he really have to see it for himself? Was it simply to satiate his curiosity? Was he bored? Or did he hear of a kingdom untouched by the wars and petty grudges of its neighbors, keeping its peace and neutrality for, cent for a century? And take it as a challenge. Whatever it was, when Technoblade stood under the shadow of a gilded castle, watching its flags flutter lazily in the summer breeze, he felt a flicker of a once familiar emotion stir in his heart. There was something about the cobblestone walls and towers rising towards the sky that reminded him of a different palace, somewhere cold and far away. Hello, stranger! One of the guards at the gates called out. You sightseeing? Oof. Technoblade, Technoblade paused at the man's cheerful tone. Most of the guards that caught sight of Techno's sword and blood red cape were quick to draw their weapons. But aside from spears that seemed more decorative than threatening, the guards at the gates didn't seem to be on guard at all. Hubris, the voices said. This is a kingdom of hubris. Perhaps, Techno drawled, indulging the guard. Although I suppose I'm more curious about the inside rather than the outside. Why didn't you just say so? The guard beckoned, beckoned Techno forwards. The castle is always open for tourists. Just come right in. That was how Techno found himself walking leisurely down the halls of a castle that, under normal circumstances, he would have been storming, blades drawn. The guards did draw the line at his weaponry and made him discard his swords at the door, as if Technoblade needed more than his hands, and sometimes not even those, to wreak havoc. The castle's lax lackness and security was disproportional to the opulence within. Lush carpets softened Techno's footsteps. Elegant tapestries decorated the walls. Flowers bloomed from vases as tall as him, and oil paintings in gilded frames. 
paintings of solemn landscapes of wild animals roaming a cultivated garden of a of a dark-haired boy astride a white horse, a hint of a smile in the corner of his mouth, and of the king. Technoblade stopped in the painting, nestled between vases of irises. Oh, he thought. That's why. It wasn't hubris making this kingdom think they were protected from everything. It was their king. Rendered in paint and shadow, he looked just as technically remembered, the years leaving no mark on his immortal face. He was standing behind a modest throne, his hand laid gently on the shoulder of a dark-haired woman that must be his queen. In the queen's arms was a golden-haired toddler, sleeping peacefully. On the floor by her feet, with his legs crossed under him, was another child, older, with a gold circlet nestled in his brown curls. Will be! A child's shrill voice rang down the hall. Technoblade's hand itched instinctively for his sword as he turned from the painting and found himself facing the very same boy from the painting. The prince. He was a tall, lean thing, his face still holding the faint traces of boyhood. He couldn't have been more than 14 if the painting he'd been grinning. In the painting, he'd been grinning, forever immortalized in delight. But here, he was staring. His eyes, his dark eyes unnaturally focused, as if Techno was a particularly interesting book he was quietly picking apart in his head. Techno had seen that inspection many times in the faces of wizen generals looking over battlefield arrangements. Hello? The prince said cautiously. Technoblade found himself raising his hand in a small wave. Hello? Wilby, wait for me! The first voice called again, closer this time, and heralding the appearance of another child around the bend of the hallway. By, this la by his lavish attire and the small army of servants following fretfully after him, this could only be the younger prince barely more than a babe in the painting, but now a rather loud six-year-old. The younger prince marched purposefully towards his older brother, Wilby, and clung decidedly to his side as they both stared up at Techno. And who are you? The small prince said, in what he must have intended to be a threatening tone, but he sounded only he sounded only like he really was a child a visitor said techno unsure of what he was meant to say now have you come to have an audience with our father the older prince asked in a decidedly more level tone you can't the younger prince snapped at once tightening his hold on his brother's shirt front dad promised today was our day with him so you can just leave now thank you tommy Calm yourself. But Wilbur, Dad said- I know what Father said, Tommy. The older prince, Wilbur, then not Wilby. Gods, no without Techno would have said and done if the man had truly named his son Wilby. Was still staring at Techno like a vulture waiting for a dying animal to drop. So, visitor, what is your business here? I have no business, Technoblade said. I'm visiting. Sightseeing. I'm a traveler. First you're a visitor, and now you're a traveler. A smile tugged at the prince's lips. This exchange would have been much easier if we knew your name. Technoblade glanced at the servants lining the hall behind the princess. Clearly an earshot, but dutifully maintaining the illusion of privacy. But if he knew their father at all, he'd know that most of those standing guard around his sons would be lethal killers. He just hadn't anticipated the arrival of a god. What would they do if they heard his name? Would any of them recognize it? Would they know what it meant to have him stand before their young princes? How long would they last against him? As he looked down at the two brothers, the voices whispered how fragile their necks must be. 
blood for the blood god, they chorused. But instead, Techno found himself saying, My name is... Technoblade? Technoblade lifted his eyes from the young princess and found himself staring at their father. Filza? Filza stood at the end of the hallway, undoubtedly following the familiar cadence of his son's voices. He glanced at them now, still standing behind before Technoblade, like unwitting sheep waiting for slaughter. But Filza's eyes showed no fear. Instead, when he looked back at Techno, he only smiled, his face softening with his familiar relief. The expression of a man after a long, hard-fought war, seeing peace on the horizon at last. Old friend, said Filza, it's nice to see you again. Traitor, the voices clamored. Traitor, 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 traitor. Father! Wilbur's voice brought them back to reality. This was a different castle, a different time. Do you know this stranger? Well, obviously, Wilbur. Tommy rolled his eyes. Dad just said his name, didn't he? Technoblade? That's a dumb name. Tommy! Filza reprimanded, with no real heat behind his words. He drew closer to them, his steps quiet and even. The servants that had followed the two boys bowed in deference to their liege, despite him wearing no crown. In fact, he looked just as much a as a traveler as Techno was, dressed in simple trousers and a shirt, perfect for blending in, perfect for a man on the run. It's been a long time, Filza said when he reached them, putting a gentle hand on the top of Tommy's blonde head. The boy arched towards the touch like a sunflower reaching towards the sun. Technoblade didn't know if the move was calculated or just a simple act of affection, or knowing Filza both. How have you been? How have I been? Techno repeated numbly, feeling a familiar chill creep into his bones. Phil, I... Actually, Philza interrupted before kneeling to look his boys in the eyes. Wilbur, take your brother out to the garden for a bit, yeah? Wilbur pouted, for once looking like a boy his age. But you said, I know what I promised. And I keep my promises, don't I? Feels a ruffled Wilbur's hair and then Tommy's. I'll join you in a moment. I just need to have a talk with Technoblade here. Wilbur stared at his father for a long moment, as if weighing the truth of his words before nodding. He took his brother's hand in his, and in his and began leading him away. Come on, Tommy, he said. Let's play outside. Technoblade's still a dumb name, Tommy muttered as they passed him, closely followed by their servants. Wilbur met Technoblade's eyes just for a moment before they were gone, down the hall, out of sight leaving Technoblade alone with the king. Technoblade turned towards Filza, his old friend, and found the smile wiped clean from his face. Filza gestured down the hall. Walk with me? Technoblade could only nod and follow Filza. They were quiet as they walked. Techno remembered days like these during their time together, long days of companion companionable silence as they simply existed together, but there was something different this time. There was an edge. Techno could sense Filza sizing him up, telling his hidden weapons, calculating his improvements. In turn, Techno mapped his escape routes as Filza led him through the halls, then up a sweeping flight of stairs. He did not want to expect violence from Filza, but he hadn't expected to be left behind either. They reached a balcony overlooking a garden, where most of the flowers indoors undoubtedly came, came from. Wisteria and ivy grew around marble pillars. Rose bushes and dandelions and carnations bloomed in mass at the, floor, at the foot of elaborate stone statues. At the center of the garden was a weeping willow, its branches providing shade for the two boys chasing each other across the grass. 
Their laughter echoed through the, through the glade, reaching even Techno and their father high up on the balcony. For a while, the two of them just watched the two princes. Uber was obviously faster than Tommy, but he slowed his pace just enough for his little brother to have fun chasing his heels. They're a handful. Phil's soft tone turned Techno's attention away from the princes. The king was almost smiling, but the hard glint in his eyes didn't disappear. Wilbur was a quieter before Tommy was born. A little bookworm, holed up in his room all day. But I have a feeling you didn't drop by for silly stories like that. Phil's a turn towards Techno. So, go ahead. Let me have it. Techno didn't know what he was meant to feel. He didn't know what he was meant to say. For years, he'd put Philza out of his mind, determined to forget what interlude, that interlude of peace. He'd let the memories fester like untreated wounds, and now he thought he'd rather die of the infection than acknowledge out loud that it was real, that the pain was there at all. I didn't mean to drop by, Techno said eventually. I didn't know this place was yours. I can leave if you... No, Philza shook his head. Don't leave. Truth be told, this reunion was inevitable. Or, I hoped it was. How long have you been here? Philza considered. How long has this kingdom been standing? Phil, that's... I know. People like us aren't meant to stay in one place for too long. Phil's aside and turned back towards the horizon. He leaned his arms against the wrought iron railings and looked out at the land beyond. The slope of the distant mountains, the kingdom that stretched on and on, aware that their unaware that their immortal king was all that stood between them and destruction. I found a small town while I was traveling. I made it something more. I told myself I would leave after a year, and then it became two years. Three years? A decade. I did leave eventually, before they figured out why their town mayor never aged. But then I found out, the moment I left, Phil's expression turned cold. They were annihilated. I came back and everything, everyone, had been burnt to the ground. It was just ashes. Everything I built. There were survivors, of course, but they blamed their leader for leaving. Of course. As they should. So I stayed. I built it back up again from a small, decimated town to what you see today. As far as the people know, leadership has been passed on from one king to another who looks vaguely like him. I'm sure the eldest of them have their rulers, but... Is it really so bad to be known? Technoblade didn't realize until Filza turned back to look at him that he expected an answer to his question. But all Technoblade could say was, Is this why you left me behind? Techno, I understand. You heard the place you loved was in trouble, so you came back. But I don't... I just... Why didn't you take me? Here it was at last, catharsis, or something close to it. I would have hunted them down with you, Filza. The people who did that to your town? I would have given you your vengeance on a silver platter. I would have given you the world. Filza didn't look guilty. He just looked tired. I didn't hunt them down, though. What? The people who burned down my town. I didn't hunt them down as much as I wanted to. They were long gone by the time they were long gone by the time I arrived, and at that moment my people needed a leader, not a hunter. And I didn't bring you because because I don't know when to be either. They stood there, letting the words settle in the silence that stretched totter and totter like a rope around Technoblade's neck. Deny it, he wanted to shout. Tell me I'm wrong. Filza did not. I don't need to hear this from you, 
techno techno blade spat. A well of old hurt and anger, once dried up, began to fill anew. Do your sons even know what you are? Who you are? The angel of death? Domesticated? What a farce. Feels stiffened. You know not of what you speak. I once saw you tear a man apart with your bare hands, and now you're telling me about leadership? About kindness? I said nothing of kindness. If I had completely renounced my ways, my kingdom would not be what it is today. Domesticated dogs still bite. Phil's a step towards him until they were eye to eye. Despite the accusations Techno hurled at him, despite their bloody history, Techno had never truly seen Phil's angry. But he had a feeling that if he kept running down this road head first, he might find himself knowing the full extent of his old friend's wrath. Fields' eyes were hard as flint, one spark away from combustion. Technoblade glanced down at the garden. Fields had followed his gaze until they were both staring back at the two boys below, who'd ceased their playing to wonder at their father and the stranger. They couldn't have heard a thing of what Phil's or Techno said, but Wilbur stood with his head cocked inquisitively to the side, as if he were turning over their words. Dad? Tommy shouted. Are you almost finished? Almost, Phil's called back. I'll be right down, kids. Tommy elbowed Wilbur and said something that made the other boy throw his head back in laughter. Then the two of them took off. Back to their games, back to their honeyed childhood. When Technoblade turned to Phil again, the king's expression had turned considerably softer. Techno could live another thousand years and still never understand how easily Philza could hide his fury. I wasn't trying to... Settle down, Philza said, quietly now, as if he was imploring a child to stop a tantrum. His eyes were still on his sons below. I was content, for a while, to watch the kingdom grow, but these mortals, in their short, fitful lives, they draw you in, Technoblade. I used to think they were moths drawn to a flame, doomed to catch fire for the most un inconsequential things. We've seen their wars, you and I. We fought them. We both know the things they do to each other. Filsa took hold of the balcony railings as if it was the only thing keeping him from floating away. But over the years, I've also learned of the things they do for each other. Their lives will always be one year, one week, one day short, but it doesn't seem to matter much to them. They live anyway. They love anyway. Forgive an old god for wanting a piece of that for himself. A late morning breeze passed through, carrying with it the scent of flowers and shredded remains of Techno's anguish. The fury was still there, and the feeling of a betrayal so grand it might never be bridged, but the exhaustion had begun to settle in. Techno was used to quick brows and long hunts, but verbal altercation was not something he'd ever trained for, mostly because he had not cared to speak to anyone that mattered since. Since forever, perhaps. And maybe Phil had been tired, too, of their life before. Always fighting, never safe. And although Techno thought it was only a matter of time before this game of peace was over, he thought maybe he could start to understand why Phil took the chance. It was a foolish move, and Technoblade would scoff at it for the rest of their immortal lives. But it would not be the worst choice anyone had ever made. Technoblade had seen the worst, and this was barely a drop in the ocean of bad decisions. Still, it was stupid. One look at Filza and Technoblade realized he must know it too. Are they like you? Techno asked at last, unsure what answer he was waiting for. Your boys. Filza sighed. I would not wish my fate on my worst enemy. Least of all, my own children. His hands tightened around the railings. They take after their mother. Mortal. Good. In all ways. 
I thank every god that has ever, that has ever existed for that. But sometimes, sometimes, Techno prompted when the silence stretched too long. Feels his jaw clenched. It's Wilbur. He speaks of voices. Voices? Phil's had met Techno's eyes. A conversation from lifetimes ago replayed in Techno's mind. A moment of vulnerability in a castle not so different from this one, where he had spilled his secrets as easily as he spilled blood. The voices, Phil. They demand blood. There was a world's worth of agony in Phil's stare, a burden only understood by a parent fearing for a child. Are we back? <laughs> are, are we back? Are we good? I hope it's okay. Is it okay? Okay, okay. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Man, took me out the zone. <laughs> okay, where was I? I'll just restart. Techno paused. What was he talking about? What did it matter what Wilbur was? What was the sudden ache in his chest? Something telling of a far deeper wound? An older affliction? He did not know this boy. He should not care. He did not care. But then Phils seized him by the wrist, as if he knew Techno was about to take off running and forced him to meet his tortured gaze. This is why I hoped you would come. Truth be told, I was very close to looking for you myself. I cannot do this by myself, Technoblade, as much as I want to. You're the only one you want my help, Techno said dully. My help? After you abandoned me? After you denounced my ways and called me a monster? Philza flinched. I would never call you that, my friend. friend. The word that Technoblade had only truly understood in the days of snow and sweet tea. I don't owe you anything, Technoblade said quietly. I don't owe that, that child anything. I know. After all you did, I shouldn't even be listening to you right now. I should just leave. I know, Techno. I know. And then Filsa did something Technoblade would never in a hundred or a million years have expected him to do. He kneeled. Filsa, once emperor, presently king, angel of death, kneeled before Technoblade, grasping pathetically at his cloak, his golden hair bowed. The voices were a chorus of a disgust and disdain. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. And when Phils spoke again, his voice wavered. I am sorry, truly, for leaving, but I am asking you, begging you, to do this for me, for my son, for the friendship that we once shared, Techno, please, please. I do not know how much time the gods will give us. What will you have me do? Techno demanded, his own voice fraying at the edges. What do you expect from me, Phil? Philzo looked up at him, his face a study of a study in agony. Stay. Stay and help as much as you can. And together, maybe we can help you as well. The voices paused. Just for a moment. Just for a breath. As they all considered the weight of Phil's words. 
And gods, that silence, however brief, however fleeting, was the sweetest thing Technoblade had ever heard. We can help you. What did that mean, exactly? What would that entail? Technoblade didn't know, and didn't care. He'd come here in search of a kingdom and peace, and found it, and he'd found it. Forgive an old god for wanting a piece of that for himself, Filza had said. And what was peace if not the silence? Was that not freedom, at last? So as the voices began to chant anew, an immortal hunter offered an immortal king his hand. The sun climbed higher towards the, towards the heart of the sky as Technoblade pulled Filza to his feet, and they were on equal ground once more. He had no idea what, was, what he was doing. But there was no true alternative, so Technoblade met his old friend's gaze and said, All right, you and me, one more time. All right. <laughs> wow. I, I really like the imagery. Like, it's very easy to envision the setting of the story and I like how um I like how this author is very descriptive in the clothing that they wear because honestly a lot of authors don't do that they don't just like like for for characters who you know like pre-existing characters and whatnot a lot of authors will just rely on you actually knowing what that character's daily wear is instead of actually describing what they're wearing. So I do like how she described how they describe Techno in the beginning with the you know, his sword and the blood red cape and, and Filza with the uh, obsidian wings and his cloak and uh, you know, the, the golden hair. Like, I like descriptive words like that. The imagery is great. It's very easy for me to envision this as I'm reading it. So that's awesome. So that was chapter one. Pretty good. Pretty, pretty good. Um, a lot of kudos for this author. And another kudos from me. <laughs> so... On to I'm gonna leave a comment real quick. Ah. Uh curse this this band-aid I have on my finger yeah I have a band-aid wrapped around my finger right now because uh, at my job I was unpacking a box and my index no my pointer finger the nail <laughs> oh uh, let's just say it's not having a it's not having a great time because like my nail bed is cracked and it sucks. No, it didn't rip off. It just cracked it. So, like, I'm trying to get it to heal. So, I have it wrapped up right now. Okay. On to the next chapter. <clears throat> chapter 2. Like... I don't want to say this wrong. Like, Carillon? <laughs> Carillon. Carillon or Carrion? 
like Carrion Bells, The House of Augustus Rings. Interesting title names. Okay, I'm not going to read the summary because I'll read the end of the summary. Okay, summary for this chapter. Or flowers failing in the futility of trying to outrun fate. Turn my mic down a little bit. Okay. Okay, so this chapter has triggers in it, by the way. So, trigger warning for panic attacks and uh, character death. Ooh, okay. Let me make my... There we go. A little bit smaller. Let me get comfortable. Carillion? Okay, yeah. It's prob probably is Carillion. Okay. Wilbur did not know what to make of this visitor. The Traveler, whatever he was. Father had come down to the garden with him, and Wilbur could tell he was sad. He didn't know if the visitor had been the cause, or something else. Someone else. A formal introduction is in order, Father had told Wilbur and Tommy. This is Technoblade, an old friend. He'll be tutoring you for a while, Wilbur. Wilbur had stared up at the man. Seeing him in the soft morning light as flats. Seeing him in the soft morning light at last. Technoblade. Tommy was right. It was a pretty dumb name. And one Wilbur had heard before. Though he wasn't sure where. He was tall and lean, and most likely a few years older than Wilbur. He was dressed like him too. With poofy sleeves that Tommy always said made him look like an old man. An emerald earring hung from Technoblade's left ear, similar to the one that father wore on a golden chain around his neck, tucked, se tucked secretively under his dress shirt. Was he some sort of royalty too then? Some foreign prince or a distant cousin that father never bothered to tell Wilbur about? Father kept many secrets. This may just be one of a million. Technoblade had taken Technoblade had taken one look at Wilbur, nodded, and then said, We'll start at dawn before leaving them. Wilbur had stared after him, perplexed. What? Father had struggled to keep a smile off his face. That's techno for you. Now they were sitting in the dining hall, each to their own thoughts, except Tommy, whose Thoughts must always come out of his mouth, regardless of who was or wasn't listening. And Wilbur tricked me, but I got up very quickly. You saw that, didn't you? Dad? Dad, didn't you? I saw, I saw, Father said distractedly. He was staring down at his half-eaten plate as if he had held the secrets of the universe. Wilbur assumed he was only doing it so he wouldn't be staring at Mother's empty seat. Oh no, Kristen's dead. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that's not funny. <laughs> but... Not gonna lie, that is kind of funny. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Shoot, I lost my place. Where was I? Alright, alright, alright. She's been taking more and more of her meals in the bedroom. Tommy hadn't noticed yet, but Wilbur did. Wilbur always did. And this techno fellow, he's a bit of an odd one, isn't he? Will he be training me too? Will I have to wake up at dawn like Wilbur? Wilbur grimaced. Please don't remind me, Tommy. Tommy stuck out his tongue. Tommy stuck his tongue out at him from across the table. It's not like you have. It's not like you have any other plans. I'm sure you'll just be staying up reading again. He gestured dramatically towards himself. I, for one, would love to be under the tutelage of Mr. Technoblade, stupid as his name may be. <laughs> Dang. Sharpshooter Tommy. The two of them turned to their father, one with starry-eyed expectation, the other with morbid curiosity. 
Father sighed fondly before ruffling Tommy's hair. Sorry, little bud. Maybe we can find someone, someone else for you. I'm sure the captain would be willing to... But I want the blade! Tommy whined. Wilbur snorted. Yeah, as if you could even wake up early enough. You'll still be in the bed by noon. I can see it now. Father gave Wilbur a cheeky grin. He only reserved for his eldest son. Tell you what, Tommy. If you can wake up with Wilbur, then you can watch him train with Techno. Truly? Tommy kicked back from the table, nearly upsetting Father's glass of wine. Good night then. Early to bed, early to the prize, as they always say. Who says that? Wilbur said, but Tommy had already gone off, leaving Wilbur with their father in the silence. For a while, the only sound was utensils scraping against plates and Wilbur's heartbeat in his ears. He would never admit it to Tommy or anyone, but his relationship with father has always been better with his brother around. It wasn't that Wilbur didn't love his father, or that he thought his father didn't love him. Wilbur couldn't remember it happening. But somewhere along the way of studying warfare and politics, or staring up at the throne, and or staring of staring up at the throne that would one day be his, of learning how to be a prince, he'd forgotten how to be a son. And sometimes, when father thought he couldn't see, father would look at him with a bottomless grief, like he was mourning something already lost. It should be Tommy, Wilbur had thought. Sunny Tommy who managed to charm everyone he met in spite of, or perhaps because of, his loud, disp his loud disposition. Not him. Not when father looked at him like that. Wilbur swallowed the last of his dinner and was set to go, if not for his father speaking, what, speaking once more. Wilbur? Yes, father? Father leaned against his hand as he considered Wilbur. Do you want me to be there for you tomorrow? Wilbur scoffed half-heartedly. I'm not a child, Father. Of course, Father said. But Technoblade is still a stranger to you. Wilbur paused his lips. Wilbur pursed his lips as he thought about his father's words. Do you trust him? Yes, Father replied at once. Wilbur nodded. Then I trust him. Father stared at him for a Father stared at him for a long time and then nodded. There was nothing else to say, it seemed, and so Wilbur left, leaving his father to the quiet. Huh, interesting interaction between um Phil and Will. Oh, thank you for joining the Discord! And welcome to the Honey Hive! <laughs> uh, yeah, there's like only other one person in there, my friend Cory. Um, I'm trying to get him into the Dream SMP story. But yes, thank you, thank you. We always take a break. We always take a break when there's a break in the page. <clears throat> okay, moving on. Tommy's door was firmly shut by the time Wilbur arrived at their sleeping quarters. Wilbur's own door stood ajar, waiting. Moonlight spilled from the arched windows. From the arched windows, painting everything in silver, the bed littered with half-finished books and the desk bearing scars from Wilbur's manifold frustrations and writing music for the guitar that sat discarded on the floor. Mother had given him that guitar for his 10th birthday. He used to play lullabies, or spooky songs, when he was in the mood for older brother mischief, for Tommy, before Tommy decided he was a big man and moved out, of the, out to the bedroom across the hall. His body felt heavy with thoughts. Technoblade, the boy who looked not much older than him, now tasked to, at tutoring him at at what? Father had not been forthcoming with that, amongst other things. With a sigh, Wilbur grabbed the guitar from the floor and dragged it with him to the window. As he plucked idly at the strings, he gazed out at the horizon beyond the glass. 
the sprawling lawns of the castle ending at the foreboding gates, and then after that, his kingdom, his birthright. He played a single dis he played a single discordant chord. Nothing had come easily to him recently. Music, literature, conversation, everything all at once had been had become taxing. Even laughing with his brother felt like a chore. Wilbur's fingers stilled on what was undoubtedly going to be another bad note. Something was moving down on the lawn. He squinted at the figure until it came into sharper for focus. Technoblade? Wilbur pressed his face closer to the glass, just to make sure his eyes had not deceived him. There were many people in the kingdom with pink hair, but perhaps fewer who also moved with lethal gaze, with the lethal grace of a python. Technoblade walked across the lawn and disappeared past the gates without a glance back. It wasn't until his breath flogged up the window completely that Wilbur realized he was hyperventilating. He pulled away from the glass and stumbled over his <laughs> He pulled away from the glass and stumbled over his guitar on his way to bed. He pulled the covers over himself as if the darkness would dampen his thoughts. Where is he going? Followed by Will he come back? Will he come back? Will he come back? Will he You're late. Wilbur blinked in the dim sunlight, barely breaking through the horizon. What? He blinked some more until he finally recognized his surroundings. The smooth marble floor, the four columns sculpted like gods bearing up the flat roof, ivy following over the roof's edge like a waterfall, curtaining them off with the rest of the garden. This was the training pavilion father's personal training area where he attempted to teach Wilbur fencing before it became clear that weaponry was not to be Wilbur's forte. It's alright, son, father had said, carefully tending to the cut on Wilbur's leg from his own rapier. Kings do not really need to know how to fight. That's what armies are for. Father had sounded angry as he said this, but Wilbur knew... Wil Wilbur somehow knew... It wasn't because of him. But you know how, Wilbur had pouted, dutifully trying to hold back tears as father applied stinging herbs to his wound. Well, said father, that's different. Different how? Just different, father finished trying, tying the bandages around Wilbur's leg and smiled at him. I'll tell you when you're older. He never had... But it wasn't father standing before Wilbur today. Well, Technoblade said, gesturing to the heavy chest in the corner. We're burning daylight here, little prince. Hurry up. Wilbur blinked again. Sorry, but how did I... Technoblade stared at him quietly as they both waited for Wilbur to finish the sentence. His eyes are red, Wilbur noted distantly, even as he struggled to remember anything else. He could not recall falling asleep, or waking up, or walking down to meet his new tutor for their first lesson. Well? Technoblade prodded. Wilbur shook his head. Nothing. Nothing. What are we, um, learning today? Technoblade cocked his head to the side, unimpressed. His hair had been pulled into a braid so tight that it hurt Wilbur's scalp by proxy. Phyllis said you're a crap at fencing. Oh, wow. Wait. Okay, there we go. Wilbur grimaced as he walked over to the chest, kneeling to filter through its contents. That's one way of saying it. He picked up one of the swords and turned to Technoblade, who'd apparently bought his own weapon. A wicked-looking broad sword with a ruby-encrusted hilt. I'm a bit better at long-range weapons, if you are wondering. I wasn't. Technoblade snorted. Get into a position. Wilbur did. That's not correct. Wilbur sighed. I told you. Technoblade walked closer to Wilbur until they were eye to eye. Wilbur was a few inches taller than him, he realized. At least until Technoblade knocked him flat on his back with a sudden blow to the stomach. The air left Wilbur's lungs in a rush. 
He he blinked lazily up at that at the ceiling for a moment before the indignation set in. He leaned himself against his elbows and glared at his tutor, who was looking more and more unimpressed. You could have withstood that if you were in the correct position, Technoblade drawled. You could have warned me, Wilbur spat, clambering to his feet. Oh, is that how a fight goes, your highness? Technoblade mocked. All right then, if it pleases you, your princeliness. I shall be striking your shoulder with the flat of my blade next. What? Quicker than a breath, Technoblade did just that. Wilbur landed on his side, his own weapon flying out of his hands. Technoblade laughed with no real warmth. I even warned you that time and I still knocked you over. But you're pathetic. Wilbur wanted to say, I'm calling my father. <laughs> Draco, Harry Potter moment. Sorry. <laughs> I'm calling my father. But caught himself before he could give that ammunition to the smug. Yep. Instead, he got shakily to his feet. His entire body smarting from... His entire body smarting. Wait a second. Huh. I never knew that's what sm Okay. I didn't know you could use smarting. Oh, I just added a new word to my vocabulary. Nice. Instead, he got shakily to his feet, his entire body smarting from the impact from the floor, and picked his rapier up from the floor. Rapier up from the floor, from the ground. Sorry. He got into position again. Technoblade raised one eyebrow. This would go faster if you told me what's going... If This would go faster if you told me what's wrong with it, Wilbur grumbled. This would go faster if you didn't fumble your basics, Te Technoblade retorted. Shut up. Strong demands from a boy who can't even get his left foot placed properly. Wilbur considered his words. He moved his... He moved his left foot, inch by inch, watched him technoblade until the man finally gave a curt nod. Wilbur sighed. See? That wasn't- Oh my god. <laughs> Wilbur barely had time to throw up his rapier before technoblade crashed his sword against it. Steel hissed. Wilbur's knees buckled under technoblade's surprising strength. It felt like having an entire house collapse on him. And if he fell, he'd be crushed. Technoblade fell back, leaving Wilbur with his heart hammering in his chest. What was that? Wilbur demanded. You could have killed me that time. I could have killed you multiple times since you first walked in here. Technoblade gestured for him to get into position. Again, again, again. Never let your guard down, your highness. Always assume the enemy is planning to strike. What even is the point of this? Wilbur asked. The kingdom has been at peace for God's know for God's know how long. I don't need to risk my neck for a skill that doesn't even matter. Technoblade considered him for a long moment. The silence between them only broken by the beginnings of birdsong as the rest of the world finally began to wake. And what will you do when it And what will you do when it does matter? Technoblade asked. It will it never will, but let's say it will, Technoblade interrupted, taking a step towards Wilbur, his red eyes never once leaving the prince's face. Let's say, hypothetically, that a foreign army attacks at this very moment. Your father isn't here to help. Nobody's here to help. It's just you. Do you just stand there and get torn apart by the mob? Will you run like a coward and leave your kingdom to the wolves? Wilbur flinched. That's not... Or not even an army? Consider, if you will. Just one very smart, very angry person. And they've got your brother. Technoblade smirked at whatever expression was on Wilbur's face. That's all it takes, you know, to kill a kingdom. A single person who knows your weak spots. So what you need to do is get rid of them. 
The weak spots, I mean. This kingdom is only impenetrable because Filza has long ago gotten rid of every vulnerability. So what happens when you take the throne? That's not true, Wilbur said quietly, standing in the downpour of Technoblade's words. My father, he does have vulnerabilities. He has mother, Tommy, me. But he has the power to protect them, Technoblade replied. And you don't. That's the difference. The sun had climbed higher into the sky, painting everything in gold through the gaps in the ivy. The warm light shone on Wilbur's skin, warming him from the inside out. He imagined the light seeping into the skin, into his bones, into the cracks of his soul, until he could, until he could be made whole again. A boy of sunlight. Like Tommy. He wanted the sun to burn away the tiredness, the sadness, the thoughts. He wanted the sun to burn Technoblade, too, with his harsh words made harsher by their truth. Wilbur took a shaky breath, letting the fresh air in and tapping it into his lungs for as long as he could. Then he let it out. He glared at Technoblade, then got into position. Fine, he said. Do your worst. Wilby, you look like trash, Tommy said brightly over a plate of eggs. Tommy? Father scolded. No, no, Technoblade mumbled through a mouthful of meat. The boy is right, Phil. Wilby does look like trash. Wilbur groaned at their remarks, and then groaned some more when the movement made his ribs feel like they were cracking apart. Bruises were already starting to form up and down his arms from the various times Technoblade had knocked him to the floor. He couldn't even reach for his utensils without pain lacing up his side, and so his breakfast remained tantalizingly out of reach right in front of him. Tommy's initial annoyance at sleeping in and missing the blade in action was only matched by his absolute delight at seeing his older brother so battered and then exceeded by his excitement when father invited Technoblade for breakfast to recount how terribly Wilbur had performed. It was to track his progress, or some sort of excuse like that, though Wilbur guessed father just wanted to stop Technoblade from disappearing wherever he goes off to, like last night. Did he cry? Tommy demanded, practically vibrating off of his chair. Technoblade seated next to him, cut another piece of meat and chewed it ponderously on and chewed ponderously on it before answering. Almost. Wicked, Tommy breathed. Father glanced at Wilbur worriedly, taking in his bruises. Techno, maybe next time. You can go easy, you can go easy a bit? No, Wilbur said hurriedly, wincing when his sore limbs protested. No, I told him not to hold back. Father raised an eyebrow. I doubt that. No, really, I need this, father, Wilbur insisted. His legs felt like lead, and some of his bones were definitely misplaced. But by the end of their five-hour session, he'd learn where to strike to kill and where to strike to incapacitate, how to block attacks as much as deal them, and how to fight off stronger opponents, which for you would be all of them, Technoblade had said as he righted Wilbur's grip on his rapier. Let the boy bruise a little, Phil, Technoblade said now, downing a glass of wine. It's good practice. Good distraction, too. Distraction? Wilbur looked, at his Wilbur looked to his father, but he was busy trying to force a bowl of vegetables on Tommy. When he looked again, Wilbur found himself meeting eyes with Technoblade. The other boy was considering him at length. Wilbur had caught sight of that expression multiple times in the past five hours, like Technoblade was inspecting him, less with the scrutiny of a teacher, and more with the intense focus of a surgeon trying not to make the wrong cut. What? Wilbur finally asked. Do I have something on my face? Yes. Defeat. Wilbur resisted the urge to stick his tongue out like Tommy undoubtedly would have done. You're a very rude guest. You're a very weak prince. I don't see what my physical prowess, 
or lack thereof. Technoblade inserted. Has to do with you being such a pissy bastard. Wilbur finished hotly. Wilbur! Father said, swiveling to face his oldest son. Cursing? In front of your baby brother? I taught you better manners than that. I am not a baby, Tommy pro protested. And what does piss- I think that's my cue to go. Technoblade interrupted suddenly, rising from his seat. To where? Father asked. None of your business, actually. Technoblade replied, not flippantly or arrogantly, just stating a fact. Father's grip tightened in... What the heck is that word? Techno Father's grip tightened infinitesimally infinitesimally on his spoon. Okay. That's a word. I think it is my business if you're living in my castle. Technoblade shrugged. Try and stop me then. They stared at e they stared each other down, the king and his visitor, red eyes on blue. A moment passed, then another. Father did not move. That's what I thought, Technoblade scoffed, and then disappeared in a whirl of fur and scarlet silk. Ooh. Wilbur glanced at Father, trying to gauge his reaction. Father had never seemed truly old, but in that moment, it felt like Wilbur was watching him age a thousand years per second. Who is he really? Wilbur asked, before he could lose the nerve. Father blinked slowly, as if coming out of a dream. An old friend, I told you. From when? He can't be that old of a friend. He's just a teenager. When did you meet him? Wilbur repeated. Father pursed and unpursed his lips like he was trying to swallow something rancid. Why does it matter, Wilbur? Because you look at him like you look at me. And I don't know what to make of that. Father's gaze... Oh, shoot. Father's gaze pinned Wilbur to his seat. Even more than the soreness of his body did. Even Tommy had fallen quiet. Sensing in the way the younger, sibling, sibling, the younger siblings do. That his brother was in the sort of trouble that required absolute silence. And how do I look at you, Will? Father asked. Like I disappoint you. Like I did something to hurt you. And you're sad. I can't remember what. It doesn't matter. Wilbur mustered, with, Wilbur mustered what was left of his strength. And rose from his seat. My other non-violent tutors are waiting. If you'll excuse me, Father. Tommy. Tommy stared back at him wide-eyed. Father only sighed. It's a long story, Wilbur. He said with infinite patience. Wilbur would have preferred he screamed, and not one you're ready to hear. Either of you, he added, giving Tommy a reassuring smile. But one day I'll. Sure. Tommy. Wilbur turned from them and began to walk away. One day. Whatever that is. Whenever that is. He expected a rebuttal. Or perhaps wanted one. But, as always, there was nothing left to say. Every They carried on like that for months more. Every morning, Wilbur would pull himself out of bed and head down to the gardens where Technoblade would always be waiting, even after the times he threatened to leave and the times that it looked like he was truly going to. Technoblade would walk Wilbur through his stances and correct them by demonstrating how exactly it could be turned against him. The tutor was never fully pleased, but eventually, they made their way through the weapons in the chest and had to request for more to practice with. Spears and knives and axes. They never spoke beyond the usual instructions, and Wilbur never complained again when, a few weeks in, he almost, almost disarmed Technoblade during a sparring session with the Rapier before Technoblade inevitably knocked him over again. I almost got you. Wilbur had grinned, even as he picked himself up off the floor. Almost won't cut it on the battlefield, princeling, Technoblade had said with a roll of his eyes. 
and I was going easy on you. Whatever helps you sleep at night. Technoblade snorted. I don't sleep. Wilbur was still debating whether he'd been joking or not. Eventually, Tommy's jealousy outweighed his drowsiness, and he began to follow Wilbur to the training pavilion, yawning all the way, with his blanket wrapped around his shoulders and trailing in the dewy grass. He'd sit on the floor, shouting unhelpful advice and laughing at his brother's failures. Technoblade, the younger prince had said at one point, Will you train me alongside Wilbur? Technoblade had eyed Tommy in his blanket, looking so serious that Wilbur thought he might actually be sizing his little brother up. Well, you do have similar skill levels. Hey! Wilbur tossed a stray pebble at Technoblade's head. It bounced harmlessly off his braided hair. I want to be strong like you, Tommy said, uncharacteristically so solemn as he stared up at the older boys. And like Dad. He raised his gangly arms up to them. Look at these, Technoblade. They're pulsing with potential. Technoblade arched his eyebrow at him, an amused smile tucking at his lips. Little Prince, you are years away yet from needing to learn anything. Your brother's training, so you don't have to. Understood? Tommy pouted, but nodded. Wilbur stared at him, feeling as if he'd just witnessed the, the taming of a wild beast. He glanced at Technoblade, who had walked over to one corner of the pavilion. <laughs> who had walked over to one corner of the pavilion to stretch. How'd you get Tommy to not kick and scream like he does when he doesn't get what he wants from me? Wilbur called out. I don't kick and scream, Tommy huffed. I let out a manly whine. It's probably because he respects me and not you, Technoblade replied curtly. Wilbur whirled on his brother. Is that true? He demanded with faux hurt. Tommy shrugged. I'd respect you more if you weren't reading all the time. I'm not reading now, Wilbur said at the same time Technoblade called. I know how to read too, just to put it out there. Afterwards, they would eat breakfast together. Sometimes it would just be Wilbur, Technoblade, and Tommy going over the practice session. Technoblade with his dry corrections and Tommy with his enthusiastic owl bite often incorrect input. But often, Father would join them, and Wilbur would be lying if he said he didn't feel a bit validated whenever Technoblade praised, or as close as the man could get to praise, his improvements in front of his father. Mother had taken to walking to waking late, and took her breakfast in her room. They'd visit her there, Wilbur and Tommy, but she'd often be too tired to speak at all. Tommy tried to introduce Technoblade to her once, but she was already asleep again by the time they arrived to her bedchambers. Probably for the best, Technoblade had said. I've been told I don't make a great first impression with mothers, mostly because I met them after I just slaughtered their children. Please reserve the morbid jokes for after Tommy's gone to bed, Technoblade, Wilbur said. What does slaughtered mean? Tommy asked. I tickled them, Technoblade said. Oh. To death. Oh. Wilbur had hit Technoblade on the shoulder, but he was laughing too. Three months in, Technoblade finally relented to letting Wilbur practice long-ranged weapons, which turned out not to be his forte after all. The session had to stop after Wilbur almost took Tommy's eyes out with an arrow. Tommy was inconsolable. Please don't tell father, Wilbur begged as he kneeled in front of his wailing brother. Tommy, wiping Tommy's cheeks as fast as the tears came. It was an accident, Tommy. Technoblade was cackling, leaning against one of the pavilion's sculpted pillars. You should see your face, he managed to wheeze out between his guffaws. Oh god, this is too hilarious. Wilbur turned to glare at him. You do know, if he tells father, then it means you're in trouble too. Technoblade snorted. I'm not scared of your father. There it was again. The arrogant dismissal, as if father were nothing to him. Wilbur clenched his jaw and to keep the barbed remarks from spilling. Tommy was still wailing, his tiny face turning red from the effort. Okay, Technoblade said after a long moment. That's getting annoying now. Stop. Tommy didn't. 
Tommy, stop. Technoblade said more loudly. Tommy stopped, only to wipe his nose on his sleeve, hiccup, and then wail again. What's wrong with him? That usually works. Technoblade grumbled, stalking closer to them with the caution of a hunter approaching a wild animal. Welcome to the world of Big Brother, Big Brotherhood, Wilbur replied bitterly, still wiping gently at Tommy's face. We hope you enjoy your stay, but most likely you will suffer. Technoblade came to kneel beside Wilbur. Tommy, Technoblade demanded, this is very irritating what you're doing. Please quiet, please quieten down. Tommy respi responded by crying louder. Oh, for the love of... What will it take for you to shut up? I'll do anything at this point. The crying stopped immediately. Oh, gods. Wilbur put his face in his hands. You're not supposed to say that, Techno. You're never supposed to say that. What? What? Technoblade demanded, panic seeping into his voice for the first time since Wilbur met him. What did I do? What the hell did I do? Tommy sniffled. You said you'll do anything? Realization dawned on Techno's face. Well, not anything, per se. Tommy's eyes began to water once more. Okay, okay, okay. Technoblade ran his hands across his face in frustration. Fine. One thing, and you'll shut up forever. I want to braid your hair, Tommy said at once. Technoblade blinked. What? What? Wilbur echoed. You once got me to let you ride me like a pony across the castle, and you asked him to let you braid his hair? Tommy nodded with all the solemnity, solemnity of a judge announcing someone's death sentence. Wilbur and Technoblade exchanged glances. Technoblade won a bewilder bewilderment, and Wilbur won of utmost betrayal. That was how they found themselves wasting the morning away, sitting together on the damp grass. Wilbur leaned back on his hands and raised his face to the sun, letting the light settle against his skin. He could hear Tommy scurrying around, gathering flowers as the spring breeze blew through the garden. For a moment, all Wilbur could feel was a sudden, all-consuming affection, not for anything in particular, for everything. For the brilliant spinning wheel in the sky, turning everything into burnished gold. For the soft dirt beneath his hands. For the air in his lungs, and the pollen on his tongue. For the distant sound of his brother's footsteps. For the boy sitting beside him that, against all odds, Wilbur found he might actually like beyond mere tolerance. For the, for the levity that had started to chase away the more exhausting thoughts. He cracked one eye open and found Technoblade staring at him again, with that all-too-serious look. What? Wilbur asked. Can a man be glad that he's not getting tossed around for one morning? Technoblade scoffed. Don't discredit my teachings like that, my teaching skills like that. You've been getting tossed around less and less these days. Was that meant to be a compliment? None of my compliments will ever be meant. They will, they will be passive-aggressive at best. Openly hostile at worst. Oh, of course. We have to pry a positive affirmation from your cold, dead hands. Is that it? Only a way you'll earn it, Technoblade confirmed. They went silent as another breeze blew past them, blowing Technoblade's unbound hair across his face. Then, before Wilbur could think about it twice, he said, What did you mean before, when you told Father our tutoring sessions were a distraction? A distraction from what? Technoblade's expression darkened for a fraction of a second before he schooled into, a into careful neutrality. He shrugged nonchalantly. Well, growing boy like you, you're meant to have hobbies beyond whatever you were doing before. I read, Wilbur said, and played music. That was a, dis that was a sufficient distraction, I think. Not according to Filza. Why do you talk like that, by the way? Wilbur shifted to look Technoblade squarely in the eyes. You called the king Filza, 
Which I can excuse because you're... Well, you. But father also calls you an old friend. And I've asked mother. Because father tells mother everything. But she never heard of you before. And you all... And you all... And you say all these things about weapons and warfare. Far too much. You're from a kingdom that has, that has enjoyed peace for decades, Princeling. Technoblade said with a world's worth of exhaustion in his voice. Beyond those walls, it's different. I lost my place. Okay, there it is. Knowing war, young, is not entirely uncommon. Kids just grow faster out there. Oh, jeez. They have to. Oh, nice. I didn't- I didn't know Poopy to say that. Smarts. I want to make sure that it's not- Should I just take the face cam off? Because it's like- I want to make sure that it's not in the way. And make it smaller. <laughs> that's how you fix it. Yep. That's how you fix that. Okay, let me just read that part again. You're from a kingdom that has enjoyed peace for decades, Princeling, Technoblade said, with the world's worth of exhaustion in his voice. Beyond those walls, it's different. Knowing war young is not entirely uncommon. Kids just grow faster out there. They have to. Wilbur took fistfuls of grass and threw it at Technoblade's face. Technoblade, unamused, simply blew the grass from his face. Very immature, your highness, Technoblade said dryly. You're being all sad again, Wilbur muttered, pulling his knees up to his chin. He looked up he looked up just as Tommy came toddling towards them, his arms a burst of color. Yellow Dear Lord. Yellow alstromarias, yellow alstromarias, white daisies, purple mal malvas, and freesias, the color of Technoblade's hair. Oh gods, Technoblade groaned as Tommy dumped his collection before them proudly. Tommy grinned as he kneeled be behind Technoblade. Dad used to braid Mama's hair all the time, before she got tired. He taught me how. Technoblade turned towards Wilbur. Should I be worried? Very, Wilbur said sagely. At least he doesn't have scissors this time, he added, recalling a particularly incense butler who'd foolishly offered himself to be Tommy's training dummy last year and ended up with less hair than he bargained for. Tommy turned Technoblade's head away from Wilbur. Hold still, he ordered, beginning to take handfuls of Technoblade's hair, tugging them into place. Ow! Technoblade said after a particularly harsh pull. Sorry, Tommy said cheerfully and began to braid in earnest. Wilbur sat back and watched them in silence, his ferocious tutor and his even more ferocious younger brother. The sunlight seemed to catch in the tangles of Tommy's hair, making it shine like a golden halo. Wilbur had never seen anyone as focused as Tommy was in that moment, working through Technoblade's hair, pausing only to debate on what flowers should go where. And Technoblade, for his part, did not move at all, or let out as much as a word of complaint, even when Tommy took time to educate them all on what exactly each flower meant. I could write a song about this, Wilbur mused, and then marveled at the thought. It was as if... It was as if a block he'd been carrying for years lifted, and his art was now inches away from his hands. If only he'd bought his guitar with him today. Tomorrow, he promised himself. I'll write her song tomorrow. There, Tommy said, at last, tying the end of the braid off with the red ribbon Technoblade often used himself. Technoblade blinked in surprise. Tommy, that's... actually good. Really good. Technoblade reached back and ran his hands delicately over the elegant braid and the flowers woven into it. He hummed appreci appreciatively, then caught himself before he could fully smile. Because he was still Technoblade after all. Decent, was his only comment. 
I'm not done yet, Tommy said, and produced one more flower. A single yellow rose. This one's my favorite, he added as he gently tucked the flower behind Technoblade's ear. The one that had the emerald earring that Wilbur had found so familiar. Because it means friendship. Technoblade stiffened. His mouth opened and closed like he was trying to breathe but forgot how before he finally said, Are we friends then? Tommy stood and brushed grass from his pants. Well, obviously. Obviously? Oh, hey! The sudden excitement in Tommy's tone caught both Technoblade and Wilbur's attention. He began waving to someone in the distance. His smile was bright as bright as life itself. It's Dad and Mama! Mother? Wilbur was on his feet at once, his heart hammering in his chest like a moth set of flame. Sure enough, there was his mother, out in the sun once more, for the first time in over a year. Wilbur took a shaky inhale, not daring to breathe again as if the image before him would dissipate like smoke. Mother, smiling at them as she walked arm in arm with father through the garden. Tommy ran as fast as his tiny legs could carry him and launched himself into their mother's waiting arms. Wilbur couldn't ignore the brief flash of pain that flickered over his mother's fe features as she gathered Tommy to a hug, but neither could he help his relief at seeing her walk at all. Well, Technoblade said from behind him. Go ahead then. Wilbur turned to his tutor, and before Technoblade could protest, took him by the wrist and dragged him over to where mother and father were waiting. Father's smile was gentle and welcoming, and Wilbur could almost forget the sadness that remained in his eyes, like a ghost hovering at the edges of a celebration. You must be Technoblade, Mother said happily, carrying Tommy in her arms as she addressed the tutor. I do apologize that this has taken us this long to be acquainted, though Phil has been telling me of all you've done for our will be. Wilbur expected Technoblade's usual icy jabs and was quite surprised when he bowed his head in what could pass as deference to an untrained eye. It is a pleasure to meet you, your majesty. Your sons have told me much about you. Mother gave Technoblade a, conspir a conspiratorial grin as she asked, and I trust all they've said is for my favor, yeah? Nothing about, nothing about how sharp my tongue can be when I'm cranky? Oh, I assure you, they've painted you as nothing less than perfect, Technoblade glanced at Father. Although Phil's a might have said a thing or two about your rigid standards for tea. Father chuckled. He pressed closer to Mother and Tommy, keeping an arm around Mother's waist, as if to steady her. As if to hold her together, just a little bit longer. I told you that in confidence, Techno. Technoblade. Mother repeated. That's a rather odd name. I said the same thing, Tommy added brightly, always eager to be a part of the adult's conversation. Technoblade only shrugged, once again demonstrating a level of civility that Wilbur would never have expected of the same man that regularly combated the king's orders. I would feel too much like a traitor if I abandoned it now. After all these years with it, it is my one constant companion, more loyal than most. Loyalty is a rather precious gift, Mother sighed softly. She transferred Tommy to one arm and reached out with the other until she was cupping Technoblade's cheek. I do hope, my boy, she continued, her voice as tranquil as still lake, that you will find the people you can trust more than your own name. You deserve that, and more, for all you've done for my family. Technoblade blinked slowly at her, for once struck speechless. Tommy giggled. Techno's blushing. I am not, Technoblade spat hotly. Yes, you are, Tommy cooed, leaning back into Mother's arms, safe in the belief that she would never drop him. You so are, Tommy. Don't torture the poor child, Mother said, even as she giggled herself. Will? Father reached out and ruffled Wilbur's hair playfully. You look a hundred miles away. Wilbur exhaled softly. Wilbur exhaled slowly. I'm just... remembering. Remembering what? This. Mother's soft smile. Tommy's cheery laugh. Technoblade's half-hearted protest. 
father's hand on his head. Everything. Nothing, Wilbur said. Forget I've said anything. He smiled at his father for once without reservation. He had never felt so light. He was all was almost a son again. Would you like to watch Techno and I spar? Father's expression softened. Of course, I'd be delighted to. It was the last good day. Ooh, breaking the page. <laughs> breaking the page. Oh, hey, Flix. <laughs> oh, really? Has it been that long? This is a long fan fiction. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's almost been two hours. It's fine. It's so early for me. Um, but yeah, this is a long fan fiction. It's only seven chapters, but the word count is like 73,000. So it's, it's pretty long. The chapters are long. We love breaks in the page. <laughs> you can breathe. So, man, this is where the angst comes in. Oh no. Oh no. Uh, I'm not excited for this next part. It looks like it's gonna be sad. Okay. Okay, okay, let's get ready. Let's get ready. I don't have tissues. The knock came at midnight. It dragged Wilbur from the comfort of his dreamless sleep. Wilbur! Technoblade's voice. Urgent. Almost angry. Wilbur, open the door! Wilbur threw off his covers and bolted for the door. Technoblade stood outside his bedchambers, his, eye, his red eyes blazing in the dark. He said the three words that would come to haunt Wilbur until the day he died. It's your mother. They ran through the castle, Wilbur for the first time, outpacing his tutor. They arrived at the long hallway that led to his parents' bedchambers, already choked with servants. Move! Technoblade demanded, his voice booming over the den. Move or I will make you! The servants rushed to the sides, clearing a path for Wilbur and Technoblade. Wilbur couldn't register any of their faces or their voices. All there was was silence, until the worst sound Wilbur had ever heard anguished cry that turned Wilbur's blood cold. Tommy. Tommy's here. He burst into the room and found his brother curled into a ball by the foot of the bed. The bed where his mother laid. Sleeping. No. Not sleeping. Not sleeping. Not sleeping. Not sleeping. Wilbur could not breathe. Tommy was still crying crying for their mother, for their father. Father! Wilbur's eyes scanned the room, but there was no trace of the king, no trace of the man who had just lost his wife. Tommy! Technoblade pushed past Wilbur and into the room. Wilbur could see him, could see it all, but it felt like watching someone else's life happen from leagues under the sea. Everything happened too slowly, too distant, too, too distantly. Technoblade kneeling by his brother, prying him off the cold floor. Tommy wrapping his arms around Technoblade's neck, burying his head into his shoulder and screaming, screaming so loud, so loud, too loud. Oh, hey, Corey, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Oh, shoot, where was I? Okay. Technoblade, turning towards Wilbur, handing him something, pressing into Wilbur's cold fingers. Wilbur looked down at his hands. It was a letter, crumpled, tear-stained by his own tears, he realized belatedly. Techno, it said. Tell the boys I'm sorry. And tell Wilbur he will be a better king than I ever was. The world fell out from under Wilbur's feet, leaving him suspended in the air, free falling with no true end. No, he thought, or maybe said, or maybe screamed. No, 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 this wasn't how it was supposed to go. Oh, said the voices. But this already happened before. Wilbur blinked and blinked again. Father's... gone? He said, not taking his eyes off the, from the letter. 
He left? Wilbur, Technoblade's voice rising above Tommy's agonized sobbing. Was that worry in the other boy's voice? I found the letter slipped under my door. And by the time I came here, it was too late. Your mother, she was... Also gone? The letter began to shake violently. Or not the letter. Wilbur's hands. But she was... She was just here. Th this morning, she, she watched the spar. She was smiling. She was... She was alive! Technoblade! Techno! This was inevitable. Wilbur clamped his hands over his ears. Shut up! It was meant to be. Go away! Wilbur fell to his knees, pressing his hands tighter and tighter to block out the sound. I thought I'd gotten rid of you! You said you were going to leave me alone! A sudden pain laced up Wilbur's arm, and opened his eyes to find Technoblade kneeling in front of him, his hand in iron grip around Wilbur's wrist. Tommy was gone. When did that happen? And the silence he left behind was almost as bad as the screaming. Come back to me, Wilbur, Technoblade ordered. Who do you hear? You, Wilbur said haughtingly, haltingly. He was not for this act, not for this stage. And the voices, Technoblade nodded, easing his grip on Wilbur's wrist. I can help you. No one can. Wilbur squeezed his eyes shut, but all he could see was his mother's still form, father's letter. Wilbur, look at me. Wilbur shook his head. I can't. Then listen to me. I can help you, Technoblade repeated firmly, because I have voices too. Wilbur, Wilbur, Wilbur's lungs began to ache with the thickness of his breaths. You do? He sounded like a child seeking comfort from a distant figure, but there was too much pain to make room for shame. I do, Technoblade said. So breathe with me until they go away, and we can figure out the next step together. That was all they did. They breathed in and out, and in again, Technoblade's hand on his wrist, and the sickly sweet smell of rotting flowers keeping him rooted to the ground, to the universe. In and out, and in again. Then in between one breath the next, Wilbur finally remembered where he'd heard the name Technoblade before. Father, he... Wilbur swallowed down a sob. He told me a story once, when I was young. The first time the voices ever talked to me, he told me a story about an immortal god who was doomed to hear voices in his head forever. A blood god. Technoblade. You're... You're a god? Don't worry about that now. His voice was distant but kind. It doesn't matter. But I don't remember how the story ended. Exhaustion was a heavy blanket weighing him down until he was leaning on Technoblade's shoulder. His throat felt raw, like he'd eaten broken glass. This story has no end. The voices said. But they sounded distant, too. Tell me how the story ends, Wilbur begged, even as he felt the last of his consciousness slowly fracture into nothingness. Tell me you'll still be here when I close the book. Wilbur, I... Technoblade mumbled something too low to hear, and then he said, Okay, I'll be here. Wilbur wanted to say more, or perhaps he didn't. Outside, somewhere far away, bells began to toll, chiming his mother's death ballad, heralding his ascension. Tell the boys, I'm sorry. His father's voice this time, as quiet as the rest. In between one breath and the next, Wilbur was king. In between one breath and the next, he was asleep. Hey, let's go. That was chapter two. Awesome. That was sad. That was sad. Yeah. Not gonna get me to cry, though. You're not gonna get me to cry. <laughs> but but still sad. Um, yeah, this chapter was great. 
Okay, so she's... They, they're telling the, uh, the ages. Wilbur's 15-ish in this chapter. And Tommy is 6. Okay. 6-ish. Around that 6-7 range. Nice. Wow. Oh, right. Our <laughs> story's so good, I tried to leave another kudos. <laughs> this was sad. Dang. Okay, wow. One, two, three, four. Four more people are reading this. Nice. Um... Okay, let's take a quick break, cause uh, I need to stretch, cause my legs are, my legs are doing the things. So uh, yeah, be right back, I need to stretch. And we're back. Okay. I really had to stretch. <laughs> I've been sitting here in the same place for too long. Okay, so. Chapter 3. This is... This is a really good fanfic so far. Like... <laughs> I felt that panic attack, Wilbur. I felt that. Speaking of panic attacks, this chapter, chapter three, when the cold wind rolls in from the north, what am I to do? Uh, there is a trigger warning for it, as you can see right here, Pan for panic attacks. So if you are uncomfortable with that, um, I, I don't know what to tell you. Like, pr take, this, take the steps necessary to protect yourself. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to read the summary, but the gist of it is hypocrisy, happiness, and the heaviness of certain secrets. Alright, let's get into it. Looks like we're going to be starting in Tommy's POV. Nice. 
Tommy knew a thing or two about secrets. He was five years old when he first heard the word whispered from father to son. Let's keep this a secret, all right, Will? Dad said. Dad had said in the gentle hush of midnight, unaware that Tommy was right outside the library door, hanging on to every word. Even then, Tommy must have known Wilbur was special. If Dad was speaking to him like that, not like he was, not like he was an annoying child, but like they were equals, bearing the same burdens and battle scars. But what if they will never go away? Wilbur had whispered back. Tommy had never heard his older brother so frightened. Tommy walked away before he could hear the rest of the conversation he was obviously not privy to. Looking back, perhaps some part of him wanted to preserve his gilded image of his older brother, like a dead fossil crystallized in amber. Because older brothers were never scared, older brothers never bled, older brothers never cowered, older brothers were immortal. He would hold on to that belief until it was too late. He was six years old when he got to a when he got a secret to keep of his own. He truly understood its burden. A year later, and his brother is crowned. Tommy stood proudly in the crowd as Wilbur kneeled before a man in white robes. The sunlight from the windows caught in the jewels of the crown held over Wilbur's head, a crown that was once their father's, but no longer. Wilbur recited oaths of protection and generosity, goodness and fairness, righteous justice and unwavering fealty to the kingdom. And the, rob and the robed man proclaimed him king. And the robed man proclaimed him King Wilbur, protector of the realm, ruler of the kingdom. Long may he reign! Tommy had cheered the loudest, enough to shake the rafters above, and, Wil and when Wilbur smiled, he knew it was just for him. Two years later, on the cusp of his 10th birthday, Tommy asked Technoblade the same question he'd been asking since they met. Will you train me? This time, Technoblade said yes. Time unfurled like unbound parchment, rolling off into the distance without Tommy's notice. They grew together, him and his king brother, taller and broader, stronger and smarter, more Wilbur for the latter, if Tommy were to be honest. Wilbur's duties took him from Tommy more often than not, but that was alright too, because Tommy had Techno. They would spar and talk until Techno was inevitably called back to the king's side, but by then, Tommy was appeased. The days he was alone were the worst, but mostly indistinguishable in their, mo in their monotonous quiet. On one of those days, he found himself drifting aimlessly through the castle, halfway down a vaguely familiar hallway. He heard something that had been sorely missed since his mother's death. Music. He followed the sound to a door that was slightly ajar. Tommy held his breath as he looked through the crack, and then lost his breath altogether when he found the source of the mournful melody. Wilbur. Tiredness etched into the slope of his shoulders and the skin under his eyes, strumming his guitar, cursing as he missed a note or two, but still continuing, still playing, still soldiering on, and with him was Technoblade on a sweetly keening violin, his scarred hands moving gently over the strings, his bow arm moving fluidly through the air. Both of them had their eyes closed, so completely lost in their own music and Tommy knew, deep in his gut, that this was a world he could never breach. And so he closed the door and retreated to his silence. At 15 years old, Tommy was the oldest he'd ever been. But he never felt so young. Wilbur's official chambers were not meant for those outside of his council. But Tommy had never been one for rules. The guard outside, the carved double doors, truly pretentious in Tommy's correct opinion, merely sighed at the sight of Tommy coming down the hallway and shuffled to the side to let him pass. His majesty has a lot of paperwork to do, the guard said, trying and failing to be stern. If so, then his majesty would certainly welcome my esteemed company, 
Tommy replied, giving the guard a grin and a salute as he pushed his way past into the king's office. Beyond the door was a large, sparsely decorated room. There used to be paintings on the walls of past kings, their forefathers with gold hair and brilliant blue eyes. But the first thing Volber had done as king was taken them all down. Tommy remembered sitting on the floor of the offices, staring up as Wilbur climbed a ladder, rolled his sleeves up to his elbow, and began ripping the paintings from their hooks. There had been such violence in his movements, as if the task was, was the very bane of his existence. Once it was done, Wilbur stood in the center of the devastation, taking in the bare walls and nodding, him, nodding once to himself, pleased. Tommy still didn't know if Wilbur even noticed he was there too. The only paintings on the walls now were the landscapes Mama used to make. Tommy's favorite was the one of a mountain range shrouded in blue mist, because he could see in the corner where Mama had given him the bush for a few seconds, the brush for a few seconds, three errant brush strokes in an otherwise perfect painting that stood as a reminder that once upon a time, Tommy had existed in the same universe as his mother. Bookshelves stood against one wall, with the other two set with floor-to-ceiling windows overlooking the gardens outside. At the center of all things was a desk and a king. Wilbur sat scribbling away at a roll of parchment, his crown laid discarded beside his in beside his ink pot and a cup of cold tea. What are you doing? Tommy asked, closing the door behind him. Wilbur didn't reply. He gave no indi no indication he even heard of even hearing him. Tommy rolled his eyes and produced two apples from his pockets. He made his way over to the desk, moved over a stack of heavy, important-looking books, and hauled himself up to a sitting position, his legs dangling over the edge. You've been here all day, you know, Tommy said idly, balancing one of the apples on the tip of his finger. Missed breakfast and lunch. Wilbur only grunted in response. Kingdom's on fire, <laughs> Tommy continued, rioting in the streets. The guards are staging a coup, and Techno is leading them. Sure, Tommy, Wilbur said noncommittally, reaching to dip his quill into the ink pot. Tommy casually moved the ink pot out of his reach. Wilbur glared up at him, finally acknowledging him, albeit with annoyance. What do you want, Tommy? Wilbur asked, irritable. Tommy took one of the apples and planted it squarely in front of his brother. Starvation's a pretty shit way to go, Tommy said. Find a less way to die. Find a less dumb way to die. Wilbur stared down at the fruit as if he'd never seen one before. I'm not hungry, he said. At the exact moment, his stomach started to growl. Tommy snorted. How embarrassing for you. Shut up. But Wilbur was putting down his quill and reaching for the apple. Tommy bit into his own to hide his self-satisfied smile. Tommy leaned over to catch a glimpse at what Wilbur was writing. His brother's familiar looping script had already covered most of the page with the words like intentions and fortifications and conscription. Conscription? Tommy repeated, repeated around a mouthful of apple. What does that mean? Swallow before speaking, Wilbur said mildly. Swallow before speaking, Tommy mocked. You sound like our old governess. So grouchy. He inhaled too quickly. Unchewed apple slid suddenly down his throat and lodged there. Tommy gasped for air, reaching blindly for something to drink. Wilbur hastily placed his teacup into Tommy's hand, and he drank it down with gusto at, until his airways were clear once more. When he looked at his brother through a blur of tears, Wilbur was desperately pursing his lips in a valiant fight to keep his laughter down. You're an ass, Tommy wheezed, and your tea is garbage. Wilbur swiped a thumb across his own mouth to wipe his smile away. Techno made that tea. Oh. Tommy looked down at the tiny teacup with curiosity. He could not imagine his hardened tutor patiently brewing tea for anyone. Even Wilbur. It's alright then. Gods, Tommy. Wilbur placed his elbow on his desk and rested his cheek against the heel of his hand. He 
But the look he gave Tommy was one of utmost affection, despite the obvious exhaustion etched into every inch of his face. Will you ever grow out of your hero worship of him? Tommy took another, considerably smaller bite of his apple. He chewed on the sweet pulp, thinking all the while of the pink-haired tutor that taught him and Wilbur all they knew of survival, not just through fighting. Techno could have left. He should have left. After those long nights of Tommy waking up crying, Wilbur's dark moods, dates where both of them felt so frayed that unraveling each other felt like the only way to fix it. A frustration and anger with no other way out than screaming. But he stayed. He stayed to watch Wilbur be crowned. Stayed to be his most trusted advisor. Stayed and kept him together when everyone else expected the boy, expected the boy king, to fall apart under the pressure. He stayed and marked Tommy's height on one of the statues in the training pavilion, despite his insistence that Tommy had not grown an inch. He stayed even after Wilbur forced him to attend balls and galas and induce and endure in each one of Tommy's jibes about the pompous suits he was made to wear. How on earth could Tommy grow out of worshipping someone like that? Tommy swallowed, shrugged. Maybe if you were awesome, I'd hero worship you too. Wilbur scoffed. I'm awesome. Wilbur, if you have to say I'm awesome to prove you're awesome, you're not awesome. Do you remember? Wilbur said suddenly, straightening in his seat and staring at the blood red fruit in his hand. When we used to pick these with mother... And dad, Tommy almost added, before catching himself. If we go down to the orchard, to the or to the orchards, with big wicker baskets, orchards, orchards, orchard. Okay, we'd go down to the orchards with big wicker baskets. Tommy rem remembered. You used to lift me up on your shoulders so I could get the ones on the higher branches. A wistful smile tugged on was on Wilbur's lips. I, prob I probably can't lift you now. I'm not that heavy. Wilbur shook his head. It's not a matter of whether I could. It's a matter of whether you'd let me. Tommy opened his mouth to retort, then quickly shut it when he realized it was true. He probably wouldn't appreciate being on Wilbur's shoulders, nor would he even need to. He'd hit his growth spurt sometime last year, and sensing Techno greatly when it was clearly Tommy who would be taller than him if he kept up the pace. That meant he would be he would soon be taller than Wilbur too. We could we could just try shooting apples down with arrows, Tommy offered gently. I'll try not to shoot for your eye this time, Wilbur replied with a laugh. I don't remember much about her, Tommy am I Admit it as he rolled his apple between his palms, as if that could somehow make her distant laughter clearer in his head. But I remember how much she loved those apple picking days. We would be there until midnight if she got her way. She used to gather the apple blossoms and toss them at us just to make us laugh whenever we complained we were getting bored. No, Wilbur said quietly. That was father. Tommy wanted to kick himself. Oh. Well, I'm sorry. I guess. I told you I didn't really remember. It's alright, Tommy. There's no need to apologize. Wilbur tossed his apple high into the air and caught it gracefully with one hand. He abandoned you, too. They polished off the rest of their apples in silence, neither of them saying another word about the phantoms that had been hanging over them for nearly a decade. It seemed to Tommy that people were haunted by two types of ghosts. The ghosts of those who died, and those who left. It was just his luck that he had both. When they were both done, Wilbur silently wrapped the cores in an extra sheet of parchment and placed it on the edge of his table for a later disposal. As he did, Tommy's attention was drawn back to the letter Wilbur had been working on when he entered. You didn't answer my question, Tommy said, idly kicking his heels against Wilbur's desk. What does conscription mean? Wilbur sighed as he took up his quill again. You don't need to know, Tommy. 
Tommy bristled at the careless dismissal. I'm a prince of this kingdom, Wilbur. I deserve to know. Wilbur crooked an eyebrow at him. Oh, suddenly you're interested in the affairs of the realm? I've always been interested. What's our highest what's our highest earning exported product then? Uh Tommy scanned the table. Apples? Tea? Parchment? Uber rolled his eyes. You're a ridiculous child. He began scribbling away at the letter once more. I'm not a child, Tommy murmured. You are. Look at yourself. You're supposed to be a prince, and yet you spend your days play fighting with Techno, or annoying the guards, or annoying me. What part of your behavior isn't childlike? Wilbur's quill stopped in the middle of a sentence as his words settled over them. Tommy felt heat rise to his cheeks and hurriedly got to his feet before Wilbur could see. His gut churned at the insult, and the lingering taste of apple in his tongue turned rancid and bitter. Tommy... Wilbur called, but Tommy was already making his way to the door. Tommy, wait! You're not the... <laughs> You're not the boss of me, Tommy spat with without turning, lacing his words with venomous anger. I am, actually. But that's besides the point. Tommy heard Wilbur's seat scrape against the floor, but no footsteps running after him. Tommy! Gods, you're proving my point if you walk out that door. I don't care. Screw you, Wilbur. Screw you! Tommy threw the doors open, starting the guard outside. He marched past the threshold, slapping at his cheeks as if that might somehow dissipate the shame gathering there. He shouldn't be this angry. All three of them, Techno, Wilbur, and Tommy himself, have said worse things in the past to and about each other. But seldom did it ever sting like this. Perhaps because it came in the wake of their father's memory being conjured up between them. Perhaps because it had been their first proper conversation in a week. Perhaps because Wilbur was, wary was right. Wilbur was always right. The door is slammed shut behind him echoing through the empty hall. Come on, Tommy prayed. Run after me. But the door stayed closed. And that was answer enough. Tommy found Techno in the training pavilion, practicing his lunges with the silver trident Wilbur had gifted him a few years back. Techno took one look at the expression on Tommy's face tossed him a spear that had been leaning against one of the statues. Wordlessly, they took their positions in the middle of the pavilion, sizing each other up for a moment before jumping into action. After six years under Techno's tutelage, Tommy could hold his own against knights twice his age and size. He'd even beaten Wilburn once. Through, though the older sibling profusely maintained that he went easy on Tommy. But he had never beaten Techno. Tommy was sure even Wilbur, who'd been training with Techno for longer, had never won against their tutor. In a truly bleak moment, when he was 13, Tommy eventually realized that the man they were fighting against might not even been using his full strength. But that didn't matter right now, and it wasn't about winning this time. Tommy rushed Techno with a visceral scream, a sound that came from deep within his chest. Techno deflected him easily enough. But Tommy continued the onslaught, dealing blow after teeth-shattering blow. He kept screaming through it all, screaming nonsensically, screaming at his brother, at his dad, at his kingdom, at the gods themselves. It felt as if his throat might tear itself apart. Tommy managed to push Techno back towards one of the statues, the one that bore marks of Tommy's height over the years. Techno grunted as Tommy shoved the butt of his spear against Techno's chest, and then retaliated by catching its shaft in, in the prongs of his trident. With a single jerk of his arm, Techno ripped the spear out of Tommy's hands. It clattered to the floor somewhere behind Tommy, but that didn't stop him. He balled up his fist and hit indiscriminately at Techno, his knuckles finding an arm, a rib, a collarbone. And Techno merely stood there, taking it all of it. He let Tommy burn his anger away in exhaustion without a word of protest. When Tommy collapsed to the ground, a heaving, sweaty mess, Techno silently placed his own weapon to the side and laid down beside him. They spent half an hour 
just like that. Staring up at the roof, listening to Tommy's harsh breathing slowly wind down. Neither of them spoke. Neither of them needed to. Silence was a language in and of itself, and Tommy was the most fluent in it. And so, he was the one who knew just how to break it. Let me guess, Techno drawled. You and Wilbur had a fight again? Tommy exhaled through his nose. Called me a child. Called me an annoying child, he muttered. He does that every day, Tommy. I know. It was different this time, though. He might actually have meant it. Ah. There was a rustle of fabric as Techno crossed his arms under his head. Well, Wilbur's not having a very fun week, so I'd take anything he says with a grain of salt. I wouldn't know that. Techno grumbled. Tommy grumbled. Grumbled. <laughs> Neither of you tell me anything. You never express desire to be told. I would appreciate being told regardless. Note it then. Another moment of silence stretched before Tommy whispered. He didn't even run after me. He would have before. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Techno shift so he was looking down at him, arm braced against the floor. When Techno spoke again, his voice was patient. Before what? Before he was king? Tommy sighed. He felt like his lungs had come loose in all the chaos. Everything in his chest was all too tight, all too sore. He closed his eyes against the pain, seeing his brother in the darkness. Brown curls falling over his eyes as he bent over his guitar, smiling at his own music. Tommy would give anything to hear Wil Wilbur play, that, play like that again. Tommy... Sighed. No, Tommy began, rethinking his words even as he was saying them. Being king has nothing to do with it. I guess they mean it was different before. Before he started choosing being king over being my, bro my big brother. Oh, Tommy. The sadness in Techno's voice made T Tommy's eyes snap open. You think he has a choice? Tommy rolled over to finally look Techno in the eyes. Not much had changed with Techno over the years. He still kept his hair long and occasionally let Tommy braid it. His hands remained as scarred as ever, with some fresh ones now and again from adventures he told no one about. And he still wore shirts with too many ruffles for Tommy's taste. But he no longer had the emerald earring he used to wear when they were younger. Tommy couldn't remember the last time he'd seen Techno with it. In its place was the sapphire Tommy had given him two years ago, mostly as a joke, and he'd only admit he was pleased to see Techno wearing it under the threat of death. <laughs> Techno's expression was, sh was shuddered, and that way of his whenever uncomfortable topics came up. His past, state secrets, dad. Something's really happening, Tommy said, watching Techno's face carefully. Something bad. Techno's face remained unchanged, save for the, tell for the telltale quirk at the corner of his mouth that signaled his anger. Tommy had only seen Techno truly angry a handful of times, and not and was not eager to add to that list. There we go. Techno's face remained unchanged, save for the tell. Oh, sorry. Things are a bit fragile right now, Techno said. But I'm trying. I really am, and I need you to know that, Tommy. I do, Tommy said resu resolutely. I trust you. Because while Techno had stayed when Tommy and Wilbur were at their worst, they'd repaid him in kind. A few years into Wilbur's reign, Techno had taken to studying up on statesmanship and politics and etiquette as if his very life depended on it. It was the only aspect he was lacking in, he'd said, and he needed to cover for Wilbur when push came to shove on the debate floor. And while Tommy and Wilbur couldn't understand his sudden zeal, they still knew that their tutor needed rest as much as any other human being, so they developed their own systems of getting Techno to eat and drink. And other times, and oftentimes, had to physically pry him away from the library. Techno eventually relented to calm him down after he knocked Wilbur to the ground in one of their struggles to get him to bed. And when he sometimes 
disappeared in the middle of the night, or went off to God's nowhere for days on end, they'd simply welcome him back when he was ready. No questions, na no questions asked, partly because the look on Techno's face after his little escapades implied that whoever asked would be thrown over a balcony. If things are so bad, why are you here then? Tommy asked. Shouldn't you be at the king's side, sir right-hand man? Techno wrinkled his nose in response. Oh. Laughter bubbled out of Tommy. Unbidden, but welcome. I see, I see. He kicked you out too, didn't he? I suggested a solution that would end all of our problems very easily. Wilbur vetoed it. Ad adamantly. Tommy grinned. So you're throwing a tantrum. Techno scoffed. I'm not you, Tommy. He paused. But I suppose under the dictionary definition of a tantrum, I am currently in the middle of one. Tommy began to laugh, that sort of laugh that ended in wheezing and hiccups. Techno watched him with a faint smile, and the two of them basked in the simplicity of it. Just two boys on the floor on a hot summer day, laughing, laughter bouncing off their skin like sunlight. Just two bros chilling in a hot tub five feet apart because they're not gay. <laughs> Oh, wow. We'll be okay, Techno. Tommy assured him once he settled down. I mean, it's you and Wilbur. You'll figure it out like you always do. Techno stared at Tommy for a moment before quickly looking away. That's enough. S oh gosh, what was that word? That's enough saccharine garbage for one day. I think. Get up so I can beat you to the ground again. What does saccharine mean? It means you need to brush up on your vocabulary, Tommy. I feel called out. Tommy got to his feet and offered Tommy a hand. Tommy grinned as Techno pulled him up. And though his palm was scarred, it was warm. Breaking a page! Yes, let's, let's actually look up what the heck this word is. I am just learning all kinds of words today and adding to my vocabulary. Okay. Saccharine means excessively sweet or sentimental. Nice. Tommy rolled his shoulders back until he heard the satisfying pop of his bones writing themselves. He and Techno had sparred until the sun went down, at which point a messenger had arrived to inform Techno that King Wilbur had said uncle had said uncle and was crying for help. Not in those words, but close enough in interpretation. Go. Tommy had encouraged when Techno had hesitated on the steps leading down from the training pavilion. At least one of us is welcome back in his, in his majesty's good graces. He should be looking for a way back into yours, Techno had replied, and was gone. Techno had spent the rest of the evenings. Tommy had spent the rest of the evenings stabbing at a training dummy with a spear. Until another servant arrived to call him to dinner, which, unsurprisingly, he ate alone in the empty dining room. Afterwards, he'd made up his mind to swallow his pride and found his way back to Wilbur's office. The guard standing post outside was gone, which meant that Techno was still inside. After all, who needed guards with Technoblade there? As Tommy drew nearer, voices had begun to filter in through the door, muffled but getting clearer as he approached. Quiet today, someone was saying, but that hardly means anything. I think they know something I don't, Techno. Tommy held his breath as he pressed his ear against the door. Did you do the breathing exercises I taught you? Techno soft... Techno's... What? Techno soft drawl. Did I... Of course I did. I did everything you said. I always do. Wilbur's fraught murmur. Then why won't you let me do this for you? Do what? Tommy had leaned in as close as he dared. Because it won't help. Wilbur had said. It sounded, as, it sounded as if this was an argument they'd had millions they'd had a million times before. We don't know why they're gathering at the border yet. You've studied history. You know nothing good ever comes from that sort of maneuver, Wilbur. Meanwhile, the longer we wait, the less prepared we'll be when they if they do, Wilbur interrupted. We're not entirely unprepared. We've I've sent the conscription notices. 
There was a loaded pause. You did? Tommy didn't know if Techno sounded more impressed or indignant. When? This afternoon, after my little brother looked me in the eyes and realized just how much I have to lose. After that point, Tommy had backed hastily from the door as if it burned him. He turned on his heels and ran, his head spinning and his heart hammering, unsure whether to laugh or to cry. Something bad was really happening, something that made Wilbur think he was going to lose everything. Tommy didn't pay much attention to his history tutors, they were never as amazing as Technoblade was, but he didn't know that his family had maintained peace in the kingdom for decades, and that talks about borders were never joyful affairs. Now, in the silence of his bedroom, he paced, working out the kinks in his body and trying hard to ignore the gnawing feeling that he was on the brink of, on the brink of something too large to comprehend. But there was one thing he knew for certain. None of this would be happening if their father had stayed. Techno did, even when they'd only known him for a few months. What had stopped him from doing the same? And then there was the guilt of knowing exactly what could have made him stay. And that what could have been done. Secrets. What terrible, heavy things. Tommy was still wearing a path. Tommy was still wearing a path through his rug when the knock came, stealing him out of his thoughts. Yes? He called, suddenly getting the urge to reach for one of the decorative swords hanging from his wall. It's me. Wilbur. Tommy relaxed and then jolted. Tommy relaxed, and then jolting back. Wilbur? Tommy opened his door slowly, unsure of who was waiting on the other side. The king? Or his brother? But standing at the threshold, his shoulders slumped, and his smile tired, was just Wilbur. Hello, Wilbur said. Can I come in? Tommy rolled his eyes. Techno told you to come, didn't he? The smile slipped from Wilbur's face. Does it matter? He asked exhaustedly. Suppose not. Tommy stood back to let Wilbur inside. Wilbur crept in like a tourist, looking at every inch of Tommy's room like every little thing was a priceless artifact. When had Tommy last allowed his older brother into his bedroom? Most likely around the same time Wilbur moved his things into the king's quarters. I like this, Wilbur said idly, pointing at an ancient morning star hanging next to the door. Really ties the room together, I think. Cut the crap, Wilbur. Tommy snapped, the morning's vehemence returning like bitter waves to the shore. Just tell me why you're here. Wilbur sighed as he threw himself down on one of the spare settees. We need to talk, Tommy. All right. Tommy leaned against the wall and crossed his arms, watching Wilbur suspiciously. Talk, then. Wilbur crossed his legs and returned Tommy's scrutiny tenfold. His dark eyes seemed to be made for, for the very purpose of staring people down. First of all, I would like to apologize for what I said earlier. You are never an annoyance to me, Tommy. But you are a child. Wilbur... Wilbur held... A hand up to silence him. Let me finish, he said, wielding not the authority of a liege, but of a firstborn sibling. You are a child. That isn't a bad thing. You're allowed to be what you are, and you're young. But that's also the reason why I thought it'd be, it was best to keep things from you. In my efforts to protect you, I drove you away, and that's the last thing I want. And you're right. Speaking with Techno did help me come to that conclusion, that we all need Techno's help now and again, don't we? Tommy scoffed, but knew he couldn't disagree. Wilbur knew it too. I don't need to be protected, Wilbur, Tommy said weakly. Why do you always look so sad? Tommy's eyes locked on Wilbur's. What? There was a world's worth of pain in Wilbur's expression. Whenever you think no one's watching, you look sad, Tommy. But I see you. You joke and laugh and shout all day. But the moment you're alone, you... 
You get this look on your face. Like you're carrying some heavy weight and you're trying to find somewhere to set it down. But there's nowhere. I've seen that look before, Tommy, and that's why I'm scared for you. Because father- Don't! Tommy croaked. Don't compare me to him, Wilbur. I am nothing like him. Prove it, then. Wilbur suddenly stood, making Tommy jerk back against the wall. Do what he never had the guts to do, and tell me. Tell me what's wrong, Tommy. Tell me what you're carrying, and I'll help you. Tommy's chest felt tight with the pressure of a decade-old secret. His eyes instinctively scanned the room for an exit, some way out, some way to never speak of this again. He wanted nothing more than to mount to the wallpaper behind him and never see the light of day again. Wilbert's expression softened at Tommy's panic, and he slowly sat back down on the city. I'm sorry, he said gentle he said gently. I didn't mean to He pinched the bridge of his nose and let out a long sigh. I'm so shit at this. Okay. Okay. Here. To prove to you that I can handle your secret, I'll tell you mine. Tommy's brows furrowed. You have a million secrets, Wilbur. Maybe even more than that. I know, but this is THE secret, Tommy. There it is again. The feeling that he was standing on the, pris on the precipice of a dark, unfathomable chasm. I, said Wilbur, hear voices. He tapped his temple. Right here. Voices that aren't mine or anyone else's as far as I know. We're still trying to figure it out. We? Tommy breathed. Techno and I. Ah. Of course. Tommy leaned slightly forward, confusion and fear warring in his gut. What do these voices say? Sometimes they're cryptic. Vague. Talking about fate and strings. Sometimes they just taunt me. And sometimes it's worse. Wilbur took a shuddering breath. So much worse. And right now, Tommy asked, not sure if he wanted to know the answer. Right now, well, Wilbur said quietly, they're telling me to kill you. Oh god. <laughs> Dang. Tommy's breath caught in his throat. He was suddenly very aware of how many weapons, decorative or otherwise, he had on his walls. Wilbur, you can't. I'm not going to do anything, Tommy. I'm not going to do it, Tommy, Wilbur said, sounding hurt that Tommy might ever think the opposite. I would never hurt you, but the voices, they're saying it's inevitable, that it's your destiny to die by my hand, that this is, that this is a story that has been told many times over, and we can't change how it ends. But, and how does it end? Badly, Wilbur whispered. His tone made it clear that whatever it was, Tommy was not prepared to hear it. Well, you don't... You don't actually know what the voices are saying are real, right? Maybe it's all nonsense, and it won't actually happen. But it already has. Wilbur swallowed, and both he and Tommy stilled themselves for what he was about to say. Two months ago... The voices told me there was something coming. That an army was gathering at our northern borders. But we don't have any enemies. That's what I thought too. But I sent some spies to investigate just in case. And they confirmed it. Wilbur stapled his fingers. His eyes as hard and dark as polished iron. Just like the voices said. A war might be coming, Tommy. What was it that Techno had said? Wilbur's not having a very fun week? 
Tommy might laugh at how huge of an underestimate that was if he wasn't too busy choking on his own tongue. War. Such a small word for such a big thing. Well, Tommy slid to the floor as his legs gave out. That's that, then. Tekla and I are trying to make, con make contact with the foreign army's general, Wilbur said, and Tommy noticed for the first time how many silver, silver hairs Wilbur had acquired, almost glowing in the moonlight streaming from the windows. We're doing everything we can to stop it from happening, Tommy. But yes, that's it. Those are my biggest secrets. The rest is inconsequential. He took a deep breath, as if to steady himself. I think it's your turn, Tommy. Tommy laughed bitterly. After that reveal, anything I say would just sound stupid. It won't, Wilbur said resolutely. He leaned back on the city, giving Tommy a gentle look. Whenever you're ready, Tommy. I'm right here. Tommy drew his legs towards himself and wrapped his arms around his knees, clinging on for dear life. This was too much. Too fast. He wanted to yell. He wanted to crack his fist open on the marble statue with Techno's little markings. He wanted to pinch himself and wake up yesterday when nothing was wrong expect except for the gnawing pain in his chest that had never gone away, even nine years later. He wanted his parents. The world had gone suddenly dark, and in the shadows, Tommy finally let go. You want my secret, Wilbur? He pressed his face against his knees, as if that might hide his shame from the world. I saw him. There it was. The truth. Or a confession. Or both. That night, I saw him. He heard Wilbur suck in a breath. There was no need to elaborate between the two of them. There was only ever one he, and only ever one night. He kissed my hair, and that's what woke me up. I saw him walk away from my bed, toward my window. I saw him open it, and I saw him climb out, or jump out. I want to say he flew out, like a bird, but I don't remember that part very well. What I do remember... What I do remember... Is just lying here, fully awake, knowing something was really fucking wrong. I just laid there. Tommy's eyes began to sting, so he closed them shut before the first of the pathetic tears could fall. Eventually, I climbed out of bed. I went to their room. Wanted to believe that I had just dreamt it all. And that's when I found Mama. He could s he could still it. He could still see it in his mind's eye. He remembered so little of her, but he could never forget how he'd crawled up on the bed next to her, trying to wake her. He could never forget his confusion when she refused to. Never the blinding pain when he realized why. In most days, Wilbur... That's all I think about. How I was awake. You could have stopped him. And I could have made him stay. And you wouldn't have needed to be king so young. I could have spread... I could have spared you all... I could have spared you for all of this. Wilbur. And now everything's gone. And it's all my... A sob tore free from his lips. Sudden and unrelenting. I want to help you, but I don't know how. Nobody ever taught me how. Tommy. But Wilbur's voice sounded so far away. But the worst thing, Tommy continued, trying to ignore the ever-tightening noose around his neck, is that maybe I should have seen it coming. He used to come by your door in the middle of the night, when you used to live across the hall. I kept my door open just to crack, after the first time it happened, just to see if he would come again. And he did. So many times. I used to think he would knock eventually, but he never did. Tommy tightened his hold on himself, shaking with grief, and maybe with relief, too. I think he was even- 
I think he was saying goodbye long before he left Wilbur. For a moment, he, the only response to his words was silence. Tommy was afraid to look up to see if Wilbur had left, angry and betrayed. But instead, Tommy felt warm arms encircle him and pull him towards something safe and solid. Tommy, Wilbur whispered into Tommy's hair. You were six. And that was it. That was what broke Tommy in the end. He crashed to his brother, wrapping his arms around Wilbur's torso and burying his face in his chest. The tears finally came, a culmination of nine years of guilt and paranoia, of stumbling through life unsure of where he stood with his brother, his, of fearing that one day Wilbur might find out what he failed to do and hate him forever. But this wasn't hate. This was the opposite. Shh. Tom Wilbur ran a hand through Tommy's hair. It's all right, Tommy. Let it all out. There was just the two of them in that moment. There were no voices, no ghosts, no secrets. Just Wilbur and Tommy. Tommy and Wilbur. Eventually, Tommy's sobbing ebbed. His cheeks were wet and cold from his tears, but he could breathe easier than he ever did. He drew back from the circle of Wilbur's arms and found his brother looking at him with a gen gentleness that he never could have deserved in a thousand years. See? Wilbur said, delicately brushing stray tears from Tommy's cheek. Isn't it lighter with someone else to carry it? Tommy snuffled. You always have to be right, don't you? Well, of course. Otherwise, I'd be stripped of my title as Grand Master of Pretentiousness. The council would have a field day. Tommy laughed wetly. What will your voices say after you suffer such a disgrace? Funnily enough, Wilbur said softly, they're very quiet right now. So what happens now? Tommy whispered into the dark. I don't know, Wilbur confessed. What I do know is that there should be no more secrets between brothers. Agreed? Agreed, Tommy smiled. No more secrets. Wilbur looked as if he wanted to say something else, but Tommy would never have the chance to find out what, because at the same time, at the same moment, Techno burst through the door, his expression like hellfire. Wilbur was on his feet in an instant, reaching for a crumbled note Techno was holding out to him. Tommy watched his brother's face drain of all color as his eyes scanned through the message. What? Tommy demand, demanded, his heartbeat ringing in his ears. What does it say? Wilbur, when Wilbur looked back at him, his eyes were bleak and haunted. You wanted to know what conscriptions were for, Tommy? Well, you're about to find out. Ooh. Ooh, it's going down. That was chapter three, you guys. Oh my god, I need to stretch. Oh my gosh, that was great. That was a good chapter. Oh, okay, so the story title and the chapter titles are all taken from Passerine by the Oh Hellos. That's a good, this is a really good uh, group, good band. I love their songs, especially Soldier Poet King. It's like, I think that's like one of their, their top songs, top fives. A really good group. Definitely check them out. But this was a really good chapter. Um, it's 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 ramping up. It's ramping up, you guys. Oh gosh, this is gonna be hell to upload. By the way, to to YouTube. Oh man, I'm scared to go on because like I know it's just gonna get worse. It's gonna go downhill from here, and this is only chapter three. Jeez. We got four more chapters left. Let's let's do this. Oh my god. <laughs> Alright, chapter four. My birds of a kind. They more and more are looking like not about to read that. Summary. Basic summary. War 
warmth and the act of welcoming someone home. Oh my god. War is coming. Winter is coming. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. So trigger warnings, trigger warnings for this chapter are violence, depictions of violence, assault, and death. Please take the proper actions or proper preparations to protect yourself if any of these topics um, trigger you in some way. Hold on, be right back. Okay, um, just letting you guys know because I will definitely, I'm going to end this stream after I finish uh, the, the fan fiction and then I'm going to start another one so we can watch Satis's animation so I can react to it. So uh, just heads up. And uh, that'll be the that'll be it for me streaming today. All right. Three men stood on a balcony where once there were two: a mortal king, a mortal prince, and their red-eyed teacher. In the gardens below, travelers were gathering, most weary from their journey from every corner of the vast kingdom. Every now, even now, more were still pouring into the capital city, staring in wide-eyed confusion, a conscription notice tucked into their pockets or crushed between nervous fingers. All able-bodied citizens of the kingdom are called to the king's castle, the letters all said, Carried from bustling towns to quiet villages by messengers on the kingdom's most swift-footed horses and courier birds talking to their familiar wind-carved roots. Taking to their familiar wind-carved roots. War is coming, and it is time to defend your motherland. The conscription letter had gone on to specify that only those over the age of 18 were to be included in the king's army. Many had chose to ignore that. Among the horde trickling slowly into the heart of the kingdom was a brown-haired boy. A sh oh no, is it Tabo? Among the horde trickling slowly into the heart of the kingdom was a brown-haired boy, a year shy of the stipulated age. He kept the hood of his battered cloak up, so no one could see the traces of boyhood still etched into his skin like a brand. Oh, it's Tabo. Oh no! Oh no! Okay. Oh. <laughs> Someone noticed. It was a girl with hair as pink. Oh no, it's Nikki! Okay. Someone noticed. It was a girl with hair as pink as the hibiscus she grew in her garden. She had lived in the city all her life. Once a man with the same hibiscus pink hair had walked into her flower shop. His eyes bleak and unfocused. He'd asked her if she had any yellow roses for sale, and had bought it all. It was only later that she realized who the man was, but by then he'd already left, heading towards the woods that bordered the city. Now she marched along the city streets that had become unfamiliar over the course of a week. She left her garden to care to the care of an elderly neighbor. A sign was left on her flower shop door, telling, hope, telling hopeful customers that it was closed indefinitely. There was nothing else to do now but follow the course of the crowd, keeping an eye on a stranger that was definitely much younger than her, wondering whether or not he'd outlive her. Oh no! 
Yeah, please. Like, I'm... No, I don't want to cry. Like... <laughs> I feel it. I feel it coming. I feel it coming. <laughs> they pass up beneath the castle gates, where a woman they called the captain kept a watchful eye. Oh, there's Puffy. Oh. She was under orders to turn away anyone too young, too sick, too old. But every time she looked into their eyes, she only saw herself. She'd clawed her way to her position, made sure to earn her reputation, and had stood guard over the royal family for over a decade. It was her stubbornness that got her to where she was, adorned with medallions from the king, both old and new. It was stubbornness that she saw in these people now. So while she did her duty by barring the way for the youngest, the sickest, and the oldest, she turned away for a moment when an aged warrior did her best to hide the wrinkles on the backs of her scarred hands, or when a 17-year-old boy pulled his hood lower over his face, or when a strong-jawed smith from the city limped by her with a broken foot that wasn't quite healed yet, well, she would consider that her duty too. By the time the boy and the flower shopkeeper found themselves in the garden, it was crowded. People stood shoulder to shoulder, pushing and pulling like a tide on the... People changed like the tides in the ocean. <laughs> People stood shoulder to shoulder, pushing and pulling like a tide on the trampled remains of the dead queen's flowers. Aww! Dang! The shopkeeper grimaced as her boots treaded across petals and stems, violently returning them to their soil. The boy did not notice the flowers at all. He was staring up at the balcony, looking at the man whose call was answered by thousands. Most of them had never seen their king before, but they've all heard the stories of a boy crowned on the eve of his 16th birthday after his father's mysterious disappearance, or death, or assassination depending on which rumor you believed. And guided by a strange advisor, a kingdom of peace would never have had any reason to know the name, Technoblade. But those who heard the folk story of a red-eyed emperor from a cold and distant land whispered amongst themselves at the resemblance, or the coincidence, or whatever word they could use to explain away the uneasiness brewing in their gut. The stories also said that the king was kind and generous, with the starry-eyed ambition that came with his youth, and that the younger prince could charm a thousand detractors with his wit and humor. Standing together, they seemed to be as different as night and day, one dark, one light, but no one could deny the shared brotherhood etched into their regal bearing, both products of a boyhood almost drowned in etiquette and decorum. The prince shifted closer to his brother. That's a lot of people, Will, he murmured. He murmured. <laughs> the king's eyes were unreadable in the hazy light of the clouded afternoon. Not enough, he replied. Their tutor crossed his arms as he surveyed the growing crowd, already calculating battle positions and drafting strategies. This was, after all, not his first war, nor did he think it would be his last. I'll oversee training as much as I can for as long as we have time. I have identified some potential battalion leaders from the guards and the people who came earlier. I'll delegate them to the responsibility of training the new recruits. Which is most of them, Wilbur pointed out. They never had a reason to learn how to fight before this. You underestimate your people, Wilbur, Technoblade replied patiently. There are other reasons besides war. Look, there... See that person with the bow? They're a hunter, used to, sh used to shooting down fast-moving targets, which makes them an asset for our archery line. Folks from the mountain regions are used to riding on horseback, so that's our cavalry, already established. Miners and smiths are used to swinging sharp and heavy objects around, giving them broadswords instead of pickaxes and hammers, and we'll be ready to go. Wilbur cut him with a bemused look. You sound almost optimistic. Did you hit your head on a wall this morning? I've seen worse odds. Tommy scoffed. This is different from all your war books, Techno. This is real life. 
He did not notice the knowing look shared between his brother and their tutor. Anyway, Technoblade continued, I reached out to mercenary guilds to supplement our offense to supplement our offensive. Our coffers can handle the hit. After all, this kingdom has only been busy with trade for the for the decades. And if it all goes to shit anyway, Tommy asks quietly. Technoblade's expression hardened. It won't. How can you be so sure? demanded the young prince. From what I've been hearing, we're nothing more than a bunch of poor saps armed with twigs against this... This... What did they call themselves? The Green Army. Wilbur replied, not taking his eyes off the people below him. Ridiculous name, if you ask me, Technoblade said. Tommy did not laugh. He usually would. That message you received said they massacred an entire town, Wilbur. He choked out. An entire town wiped out overnight like ants. Wilbur's hands tightened around the balcony railings, his knuckles turning white as he, as he squeezed. They were taken by surprise. We will not be so unfortunate. None of them said the obvious, which was the fact that if Wilbur had not held his secret so close to his chest, the town that once sat on their northern border might have survived. They might have been warned. They would have been saved from their merciless doom. Hypotheticals, Technoblade had told them before, were worthless, and only crippled their way forward. But it still sat in the uneasy silence between them, broken only by the tutor saying, other towns along the Green Army's route would have been evacuated. Other towns along the Green Army's route have been evacuated. We should be expecting refugees to arrive in the city in three days. But the temporary camps will be finished and ready by then. And what's the status in the army itself? Based on the spies' reports, we have half a month at most before they arrive at the valley, which gives us another week to prepare the troops before we set out. The army, the armory should be done tiling and divvying up weapons by tomorrow, and caravans should be loaded with other supplies. And the other thing we planned? Gathering the materials as we speak. The alchemists are working as fast as they can, given that it's delicate work, but it should be done before we go. Good. Wilbur raised his head towards the sun, reading in the last sweet wind spring. As he did, Tommy and Technoblade were the only ones to notice the fresh scratch marks running down the pale column of his throat. Tommy opened his mouth to speak, but was silenced by a quiet shake of Techno's head. I guess it's time. In one smooth motion, Technoblade jumped onto the balcony railings, placing, pre balancing precariously like an acrobat on a tightrope, his beloved trident in his hand. He drove the butt of the trident against the railings, producing a sound like a bell tolling over and over until the crowd was almost silent, their attention caught. Your king, he shouted, will now speak. I suggest you listen. He dropped back between Tommy and Wilbur. He gave him, who gave him a grateful smile, who, before turning back to their people, their army. Friends, Wilbur began, his voice carrying out over the still crowd, now hanging on to his every word. I see you all from where I stand. I understand you're afraid. You're confused. Years ago, I promised you peace on my father's crown. And now I call you to war. This is nothing less than treason. Rest assured, I will be facing consequences for it. The crowd stirred. Even Tommy looked at his brother in surprise, a question swiftly dying on his lips as Wilbur spoke. But that will be later, the king continued. For now, we face an enemy that has mercilessly, that has mercilessly slaughtered our brethren on the northern border. That is what we shall keep in mind as we ready to face them. More than a battle to defend ourselves, this is a war of revenge. We shall remember the innocence lost in the nonsensical greed of our invaders, and I vow to deliver you your vengeance on a silver, pl on a silver platter. Techno's eyes darkened, but he did not interrupt. 
His gaze drifted to the marble pavilion sitting on the distance, right where the crowd stopped. Its chest had been pilfered. The blunted training weapons melted down to make sharper, deadlier blades. The ivy tumbling from its roof swayed slightly in the wind, offering him a brief glimpse at the empty, dust-covered floor beyond. He wondered if he'd ever set foot in it again. The shopkeeper was the only one not watching the king as he spoke of bravery and keeping the faith instead. Keeping the faith. Instead, she followed the tutor's far-off gaze, but all she could see was a small white building overgrown with weeds. This will not be the end of our nation, the king said with a note of finality, his dark eyes sweeping across the gathered crowd, but not seeing their faces at all. He spread his arms as if welcoming an embrace from someone no one else could see. It has stood for centuries, and it will stand for centuries more. We will see our enemies burning, my friends, and it will scatter their ashes on the graves of the people they took from us. And anyone who survives the fire will wish they had perished in the flames, and not by my hands. My only hope is that you might feel the same, and trust that you are in the most capable hands I could find. He turned to the tutor. You are in the safekeeping and guidance of General Technoblade. Together, we would defend this kingdom, or die trying. The silence of the crowd gave way to thunderous applause, the exultant cry of thousands of hundreds of people who did not know truly what awaited them on the battlefield. The aged warrior the aged warrior with the scarred hands was in intimately familiar with violence, and turned bitterly away from the excitement. She had been like them once, but no longer. They would learn sooner or later, but it would not be a gentle lesson. However, they were united in some things. They trusted their young king and their prince. They trusted their general. They wished to see their enemies burn. The boy in the crowd felt that unity down to his bones. This is it, he thought. This is what it meant to be. This is what it meant to be a part of something, to belong. He felt a smile creep onto his face, and soon he was joining the noise, hollering until his lungs began to ache, joining in the pe people's furious glee. He was going to hold the line. He was going to drive the enemy back and protect the land that raised him. And he was going to be a hero. At 17 years old, Flubbo was the oldest he'd ever been, but he never felt so young. Oh my gosh, he's probably going to die. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Only one person did not seem impressed by the king's words. The tutor, turned general, was staring at the king. His mouth a thin line of disapproval. Since when did I get that promotion? Technoblade acts slowly. Wilbur shrugged, dismissive. You're already acting like a general anyway. But I... Technoblade. The king's voice turned cold as he stared at, and he stared his tutor down. You promised to help me. Was that a lie? Technoblade's eyes flashed dangerously. Careful, Wilbur, he said quietly. You're forgetting who you're talking to. Wilbur blinked, his eyes suddenly clearing. He opened his mouth for some sort of retort, perhaps an apology. But then there was Tommy, brilliant, loud Tommy, leaning so far over the railing, Technoblade had to pull him back by the had to pull him back by the back of his shirt. When he turned to them, he was beaming, his eyes bright in the afternoon glow. Afternoon gloom. We're going to win, Tommy said, his ears still ringing for the crowd's approval. We're actually going to win, aren't we? Oh, poor baby. Oh no. Wilbur and Techno ex exchanged one glance. One glance, and all was forgiven. The conversation shall for another day. The general still looked at the king with something close to concern. The dark circles under the king's eyes were getting harder and harder to ignore each day. But none of that mattered anymore. If Tommy said they were going to win, then by the gods, neither of them would tell him otherwise. Not when he looked me happy as he'd been in a month. By this time next month, 
will be back to worrying about trade routes and bothersome sycophants. Wilbur assured him. What the hell's a sycophant? Gods. The king gave his brother a look that was equal parts annoyed and adoring. Remind me to hire a better linguistics tutor for you when we get home. Tommy rolled his eyes. Good luck finding someone that could stand me. I'll chase anyone away in three days, at most. Bet your whole damn life on it. Wilbur grinned at Technoblade. I can think of one person. Techno, will you finish that sentence? Technoblade drawled in his usual monotone manner. And I will end your bloodline right on this balcony. I will throw you off. Witnesses be damned. As the king and prince dissolved into laughter, for one shining moment, children again, Technoblade found himself smiling. The sky was dark and bleak, but there, on that balcony, there was sunlight. It's you and me, said Technoblade, putting one hand on top of Tommy's head, the other on Wilbur's shoulder. One more time. Oh! Oh my gosh! That's what he told Phil. Oh my god. Ah, the feels! Oh, I hate it! <laughs> Stop making me feel this! Emotions! Ugh. Whew, we love breaks in the page. Breaks in the page means I can stretch. Yeah. This is so good. Like, this is really good. I really love how it's written. It's very descriptive. The imagery is great. Like, I can literally... I'm visually... As I'm reading... Like, sometimes that's why I stumble over words. Because I'm literally, like, just visualizing all of their movements as I'm reading this loud. It's great. It's great. I'm... I'm scared. I, I, I mean, I know... I already know who's gonna die. Because Twitter spoiled it for me. But like, come on, man. I, I don't want him to die. <laughs> I don't want him to. Ah. Okay. The blue valley stretched before Tommy, disappearing into the hazy horizon. The two mountains that bordered the valley, valley rose menacingly in front of him. Two endpoints of the imposing mountain ranges that served as the kingdom's natural borders. A river ran through the middle of the valley, lit into liquid gold by the sun slowly rising over the distant hills. All in all, Tommy thought as he breathed in the cold dawn air, this would not be the worst looking place to die in. The valley was named after the blue irises that, thri that thrived in it, lining the cliff sides and blooming along the riverbanks, but they were not the flowers Tommy was in search for. He ventured down the hillside, keeping his eyes closed to the ground keeping his eyes close to the ground. He rolled up his pant legs and kept to keep them dry from the morning dew that clung to the under to the underbush underbrush. But it felt but it left everything below his knees vulnerable to the traps that had been set around camp. One wrong move and he'd lose a foot for his troubles. But he was determined to make the trip worth it. It had been a week since they'd arrived at the valley and while that meant most of their preparations were finished, it also meant that the other shoe would drop any day now. Tommy could feel it breathing down his neck. The only way to combat it was relentless distraction, keeping his hands busy. So he traveled down the hill, one careful step at a time, until a flash of yellow in his peripheral, in his peripheral caught his attention. Found you, he said, making his way over to the flowers clustered under a rock, almost indistinguishable from th from their blue iris neighbors, if it weren't for the golden sinner that earned them their name. When Tommy strolled back into camp, he had a fistful of morning glories clutched in his hand and a grin on his face. Everybody was already awake, clustered around cook fires, going through morning exercises, or just milling about. Someone had brought their guitar, and its soft music echoed above the sounds of conversation and laughter. People raised their heads when Tommy passed, calling his name or waving over to join them for breakfast. He cheerfully declined, but not before exchanging jokes and pleasantries with some of the, with some of the more familiar flo folk. It was easy to miss the shadows this way, and the right light 
You might miss the tussled hair of those that had not slept in days, or the bleak look in the captain's face quickly hidden by a strange smile of a smell of sulfur that clung to their clothes like a nasty, unrelenting parasite. It's pretty tragic, isn't it? The question stopped Tommy dead in his tracks. He turned toward the person who asked, found himself in a found himself in front of a girl seated by a grindstone, carefully sharpening a small blade. Pardon? The girl smiled as she nodded towards the flowers in his hand. Morning glories. They wilt the same day that they bloom, lasting only until the sun sets, she paused. Maybe less, now that you've picked them. Tommy flushed with embarrassment, suddenly getting the urge to hide the bouquet behind his back, as if that might somehow erase what he did. I'm sorry, I didn't think about- The girl simply laughed. No, don't be. I would be the world's biggest hypocrite if I told you- If I told you all for picking flowers. At Tommy's confused look, she explained, I'm a flower shop. I own a flower shop, back in the city. Oh! Tommy looked down at the flowers, clutch in his hand. He, his brows furrowing, furrowing as he thought. It is sad, I suppose, that they die so quickly. But aren't they beautiful while they last? Grindstone slowly ground to a halt as the girl merely sat there, staring at Tommy with an inexplicable expression on her face. Well, thought Tommy, this is awkward. You know, your highness, the girl said at length. You remind me of someone. He's a soldier in this camp. Okay, emergency, emergency break. Okay, y'all got an hour to finish this. About to be speed reading. <laughs> About to be speed reading. Speed demon. Okay, here we go. I got an hour. Four o'clock. I've got to be done before four o'clock. All right. Shoot, where did I leave off? You know, your highness, the girl said at length, you remind me of someone. He's a soldier in this camp. And about your age as well. He's off somewhere training right now, but I have this feeling that if you'd only meet, you'd make good friends. She's talking about Tubbo. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Tommy opened his mouth to reply, but found he could only nod in agreement. The girl gave him a small, sad smile as if she could understand his silence, even more than if he had spoken and went back to her work. Tommy pried his feet from the ground and began walking towards the heart of the camp, but the girl's wor words followed close on his heels. That was the true tragedy, wasn't it? More than the flowers that only bloomed for a day, the bitterest devastation was in the what-ifs. Tommy didn't, didn't understand why, but he found himself lingering one scenario. A different life where he had met that person that he, that he reminded the girl of, where neither of them were young soldiers. You'd make good friends, she said, but that wasn't right. Tommy felt inexplicably down to his bones that if he'd met that boy, they would be brothers. It was only until the royal tent was in view that Tommy realized he didn't even ask the girl for the boy's name. Even if we moved this battalion here, we could provide cover, but we would also run the risk of- Tommy? Tommy looked up. He hadn't even realized he'd entered the tent. He found Wilbur standing at the large chest that took up that took up the most room, leaning over a map littered with small carved pieces that represented various troop positions. Beside him, his hair unbound, was Technoblade. Both were staring at Tommy with concern. 
What? He demanded. You're... You're crying, Tommy. Wilbur said softly. Tommy touched his face, his free hand to his cheek, and he... and was surprised to find it was... Just a <laughs> Tommy touched his free hand to his cheek and was surprised to find it come away wet. He rubbed furiously at his eyes until they were clear... until they were clear of tears. This was not the time. This was not the time. He strode deeper into the tent, ignoring the worried look Wilbur threw Techno, and Techno's answering shrug. Tommy Tommy stopped at one corner of the map and pointed to a cluster of carved archers clustered on what would be the hill they were currently on. You don't need that many, he said determinately. Just one. Just you, Wilbur. Wilbur seemed frustrated by the change of topic, but had no choice other than to follow his little brother's lead. You're overestimating my aim, Tommy. Tommy drifted away from the map, throwing himself on a spare chair in the corner. He gestured Techno over, and the general silently complied. You always pull through when it matters, Tommy said. Techno took a seat on the ground in front of him, his back to Tommy. As Tommy gathered Technoblade's hair into his lap, he added, Except the many, many times you lost a duel with Techno. Normally, this would warrant a chuckle, or at the very least, an indignant eye roll. But Wilbur simply leaned over the map again. His expression shuddered once more. Techno turned to Tommy and whispered, We must not break his intense, beast-like focus. <laughs> Tommy snorted. The only beast-like thing about him is that tangled lion's mane he calls hair. Wilbur's head snapped up to glare at them both. I heard that. Of course you did, Techno said, turning back away. Lions have an unparalleled sense of hearing. Tommy laughed quietly to himself as he began braiding Techno's hair, his fingers making knots with the ease that came with years of practice. This had been their routine for the past year. Wilbur would pour Wilbur would pour over the battle plans. With a wild-eyed obsession that got more and more frenzied by the day, Techno would call out every flaw in Wilbur's proposed changes until they encountered one that seemed to be acting useful. To be actually useful. And Tommy would braid. It kept his hands busy. If it weren't for the distraction of Techno's hair between his fingers, Tommy would most likely join the flower shop girl over the grindstone, mindlessly polishing his spear until doomsday. Sometimes, Tommy would, make, would wake up in the middle of the night and find his brother still awake, reviewing their plans and muttering to himself, or not to himself, the voices, the mysterious, omniscient, creepy-as-all-hell voices that had plagued his brother for years. Tommy began to weave the morning glories he'd found into Techno's hair to hide the fact that his hands had started shaking. Two nights before, he had, had been the worst of it. Tommy had been awoken by the noise of glass shattering. Opening his eyes, he found Wilbur standing over his cot, a shard of looking glass clutched in his hand and raised over his head, ready to strike it into Tommy's chest. Tommy had stopped breathing completely. Will? He said, his voice coming out meek and trembling. We're meant to kill you. Wilbur had croaked, blood dripping down his arm from how tightly he was holding their broken glass. We're going to kill you, Tommy. It's fate. It's meant to be. Wilbur! Tommy had reached out to clutch his brother's shoulder. Wilby, please don't hurt me. Wilbur had blinked rapidly, his eyelashes glistening with unshed tears. You haven't called me that in such a long time. And the glass shard had dropped but not into Tommy's flesh, into the ground beside his cot, driven into the soft dirt. Wilbur had kneeled beside him for the rest of the night, whispering apologies that chased Tommy into, into his uneasy sleep. By morning, Wilbur seemed to have completely forgotten the incident, or chosen to ignore it completely, and Tommy was already plucking flowers off the hillside with shaky fingers. Tommy looked up now to find a white cloth tied around Wilbur's left hand where the glass had come to his skin. It was the only evidence that the night had not been a dream, and that Wilbur's voices were slowly taking over. 
Must be the stress, Tommy thought as he braided the last of the morning glories into Techno's hair. When the war was when the war was over, Wilbur would be back to his normal self again, and Tommy could go back to not being absolutely terrified of his older brother. Done, Tommy said at last, flicking Techno's finished braid over Techno's shoulder. Finally, Techno stood and plucked one of the morning glories off his hair. He tucked it behind Tommy's ear before moving over to one of the chests tucked under the table. Consider this a sign of my gratitude. He opened the chest and pulled out something dark and folded. When he unfurled it, Tommy shot to his feet, his eyes going wide at the blue and red coat Techno held up. Its golden buttons gleaming, the royal coat of arms stretched over, stitched over, where Tommy's heart would be. They finished it! Tommy couldn't help but laugh, couldn't help the laugh that bubbled out of him. They actually finished it! Gods, Tommy, Techno said with a small smile. It's just a uniform. But it wasn't just that, and Techno knew it. He and Wooper had received their own uniforms weeks before, the general and the king in their bold colors. In the chaos of preparation, no one had noticed the prince following in their wake in a simple white tunic until the very last minute, and now the tailors had done it. They'd actually finished it. Tommy bounded up to Techno, grinning so hard he thought his cheeks might split from pure glee. Techno rolled his eyes, but held out the coat for Tommy to slip into. It fit. Perfectly. Tommy spun a small circle before giving Techno a mocking bow. Sir General! Techno returned the gesture. Your Highness. You too, Wilbur said, and Tommy could hear the smile in his voice however faint, are so stupid. Tommy waltzed over to his brother, knocking the car of peace that Wilbur was about to put down on the map. Over the sounds of Wilbur's protest, Tommy grabbed his hands and pulled him along, humming a vaguely familiar tune, spinning him in slow circles that could be called a dance under the, lo the loosest of definitions. Wilbur went slack as Tommy continued to hum the song allowing Tommy to spin him more and more. I can't believe you still remember that, Wilbur said softly, his expression unfathomable. Remember what? That song. And then they heard it. The sound that turned Tommy's blood cold. The sound that made Tommy and Wilbur freeze in their tracks. The sound that made Techno reach instinctively towards both of them. The drums of war echoing over camp, eclipsing the music of a guitar, the conversations of friends, the screeching of a blade against the grindstone, the thud, thud, thud of a 17-year-old soldier practicing his archery against a dark oak tree, the thud, thud, thud of the army's collective heartbeat, the thud, thud, thud of a thousand feet marching closer and closer. The enemy had arrived at the Blue Valley. Break it a page, got a break it a page, break it a page, got a break it a page. Oh my god. Oh. Okay, got 50 minutes. <laughs> I'm not even close to the middle of this. I might have to end stream early because I'm going to be reacting to Quackity's stream. Am I? I've never reacted to Quackity's stream though. I kind of, I kind of just want to watch it for myself. Okay. They emerged from the mist like specters, the hazy sunlight glinting off their polished blades. Up on the hill, Techno could see them moving through the valley in a steady stream, the soldiers indistinguishable in their tight, in tight formation. At the front, someone bore their flag, two swords crossed on a simple green background. The sight of it made Techno ball up his fist with a sudden, unidentifiable anger. This was it. It seemed like the entirety of the green army was here, as expected, but the valley would serve as a choke point in the royal army's favor. It was also the only direct path towards the heart of the kingdom. So soon, so now, both sides were going to throw all their pieces on the board. One decisive battle, a quick end. Only one army would emerge from this valley intact and Techno would be damned if it wasn't Wilbur's. 
Techno turned to the king, standing beside him. Are you ready? Wilbur's eyes were, lo were locked onto the mountains. Ready as I'll ever be. The camp behind them was empty. Everyone was in position, moving like clockwork under orders that they'd been practicing for days. The only ones left on the hill were Wilbur, Tommy, and Techno. And the archers. Tommy bounded up to them at last, his chest heaving with effort. They sent up the flare, he announced breathlessly. It's time to go. Wilbur turned towards the group of archers behind him. Between them was a raging campfire, sending flickering shadows over Wilbur's face as he took one arrow from his quiver and dipped its cloth covered cloth covered point into the flames. The dozen archers, the best of the best, handpicked by Wilbur himself, copied him wordlessly. The cloth, smothered in a special incendiary fuel, would burn faithfully until it reached its mark. Wilbur turned back towards the valley, knocking the arrow into his bow. With a deep breath, he pulled the arrow back and aimed towards the sky. Behind him, the archers did the same. Hold, he ordered. The green army marched closer. Hold! Techno felt the hand close around, close around his, nails digging into his palm, and he looked down to find Tommy staring intently at the encroaching forces, his eyes unblinking. They were close enough now that Techno could see the glare of the dawning sun bouncing off their breastplates. Wordlessly, Techno squeezed Tommy's hand. Now, Techno thought, it has to be now. At the same time, Wilbur called out, Fire! A dozen and one burning arrows arched out over the valley like comets of, rolled in, of red and gold. The green army paused, perhaps in confusion at the pathetic display of force. Just thirteen arrows soaring across the air? It would not even hit the front lines. But that didn't matter. They were not the intended target. Once upon a time, Wilbur's aim had been so poor, it would have taken nothing short of a divine of divine intervention to correct it. So Techno corrected it. <laughs> See what they did there? Now, Wilbur shot true. His arrow light landed amongst the weeds. And then there was fire. It felt like the whole valley was set ablaze, the heat searing Techno's skin even from where he stood. The burning arrows had ignited a line of fire that ran horizontally through the valley, cutting the green army off completely. Soldiers from the royal army had doused that area in the ever-burning fuel the moment they saw the enemy coming, and then promptly fell back into the mountains, taking shelter for the next phase. The fire would not hold them off forever. Wilbur gave a signal, and the archers scattered to their next position, leaving the three of them truly alone, watching the wall of fire for the first signs of life. It came in the form of a man in a white cloak, stepping through the flames like it was merely an inconvenience. He shrugged off the heat, flicking an ember off his shoulder before his eyes found them on the hill. He pointed his sword straight at Wilbur. I'm telling you right now, I'm calling it that sap now. <laughs> I'm calling it that sap now. That isn't a white flag of surrender, Techno. Wilbur said quietly. No, it is not. Techno replied, finally letting go of Tommy's hand and reaching for his trident. It was a long shot anyway. A little heat's nothing to mass murderers. You should know, his voice is purred. This is not the time for your sass, Techno thought back, as if that might stop the age-old melody that was starting to play in his head. Where was Phil? Where was Phil? The rest of the enemy the rest of the enemy army followed after the man in white, less gracefully, but stubbornly, like like damned cockroaches crawling over the valley. And then there was a battle cry, ringing from all directions as the royal army appeared from their hiding spots, in trees or in the weeds, from the river and from the mountains, and catching their enemy by surprise. 
but the green army was well trained. They recovered swiftly, and though most of their army was stuck behind the fire, they were biting back. It wasn't long until bodies were dropping, and not just the enemies. Techno's hand tightened around his triton as the valley filled with the sounds of war, but it was not out of fear. Techno would never admit it out loud, but he could feel something almost like excitement pounding through his veins. This was familiar. This was something he knew. Deep in his bones, he could do without failure. Being Wilbur's teacher, and then Tommy's, that had been terrifying. But this? This was nothing. This was just another battle to fight. Just another war to win. We need to help, Tommy said, his feet already moving down the hill. Wilbur's hand shot out, dragging Tommy backwards. Both Techno and Tommy looked at him in surprise, but Wilbur was looking past them at the carnage happening right below their feet, his eyes dark as the earth of a freshly dug grave. Wilbur? Tommy asked in astonishment. Wilbur blinked rapidly, like he was coming out of a dream. Not yet, he said quietly. What do you mean, not yet? Tommy demanded, pulling himself out of Wilbur's grip. Our people are dying down there! Wilbur, Techno spun. Techno spun Wilbur by the shoulders towards him. We have to go. Now! Wilbur took a rattling breath. I know. Oh, damn it, I know! He glanced at Tommy, standing beside them with his face drawn in confusion. But I can't let Tommy... Don't talk about me like I'm not here! Tommy spat angrily. Wilbur, this is neither the time nor place to underestimate me. We need to go! Tommy, Wilbur said, staring at Tommy in shock. I never underestimate you! Then prove it! Let's go! You're right. Tired resignation colored Wilbur's words. But stay close to me. He looked grimly back at Techno. Don't lose yourself out there. Techno could hear the warning in his voice. Take your own advice, your majesty. Techno replied sourly, taking in Wilbur's wide eyes and trembling hands. I'm serious, Techno. Wilbur's expression hardened as he lowered his voice, speaking to Techno and Techno only while speaking to Techno and Techno only while Tommy was distracted by the fight below. This is a direct order from your king. Keep them in check. He thinks he can control you, the voices whispered. He thinks he is your master. Will you prove him right? Like the loyal little dog you are? I promise, Wilbur, Techno said. After all, domestic dogs, someone once said, still bite. All right, Wilbur said, shouldering his bow with a look of determination. Let's go to war, boys. Wait, I'm so confused. What's going on? Uh, breaking the page, so we're good. We're, we're pausing for a quick second. I thought he said he was going live in an hour. Bruh, quackity. Bro, people are telling me I'm gonna cry on Instagram. Like, please. Okay, he's not live yet, so. The first time the captain killed someone, she was 15. He would have killed her. She had seen it in his eyes, lost in a drunken frenzy in a small, lonely tavern far from here. He'd come at her with his heavy hands, and so she'd taken a bottle from one of the tables and broke it against the side of his head. And then, that hadn't been enough to stop him, she'd shove the sharp pieces clean to his throat. She'd ran from the tavern right after, ran from the town, and didn't stop running until she reached the kingdom capital, where a king, with mercy sewn into his smile, had offered her a job, a home, and a life that ensured no man would ever dare cross her again. But even after all these years, 
The captain could still remember the feeling of skin giving way beneath the sharpness of her weapon. She could still see the man's face, contorting with pain and disbelief, barely able to process what was happening before the death throes took him. She could still hear him choking on his own blood, gurgling wetly before he was finally, finally still. But there was a moment between the killing and the running where she merely sat beside the corpse of her own doing, numb and empty and cold. The soldiers this time would not be so lucky. She could see it in their faces, the ones who'd never seen a day of violence in their lives, making their first kills right in front of her. She could see, she could see some of them hesitate, panic, fall into the same abyss she did once before. Most shook themselves out of it, their brains shoving the damage for another day. But others stood frozen, caught in their own, thro in their own thoughts until their comrades found them or their enemies dead. The captain could not help. She wanted to more than anything because wasn't that her job? Wasn't she meant to protect them? But then another enemy would come flying her way and all she could think about was staying alive and surviving the next hour, the next minute, the next breath. The Green Army had already begun to find ways through the Wall of Fire, and it wouldn't be long until the rest of them could arrive with a vengeance. The captain swung her gladius, deflecting the oncoming blow of an enemy before thrusting her blade deep into his chest. She did not look to see him fall. She was already moving across the battlefield, slicing her way towards the group of royal soldiers, pinned between a rocky incline and a half a dozen enemies. She took two down before the rest noticed her, and the captain found herself facing four people at once. With a shield in one hand and her sword in the other, there was little the captain could do but face them down. This is it, she thought. This is my final stand. You little shit, one of them spat at her. You think you're so brave, all on your own? They surged towards her, and the captain raised her shield instinctively for a blow that never came. When she looked again, she found all four soldiers dead on the ground, with a man in a red and blue coat and flowers in his hair standing over the still twitching bodies. Blood dripped down the prongs of his trident, too much to have come from just the four bodies. Four throwing knives were already missing from the bonlier across his chest. The bondolier, 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 the sounds fancier, and the expression of his face was cold enough to freeze hell. Stop staring and get to work, soldier, Technoblade said. The very same Technoblade the captain had seen carrying the small prince on his shoulders around the castle. The same Technoblade that shuffled uncomfortably in two tight suits at formal functions that he nevertheless always saw through the end. The same Technoblade that the past king, the captain's savior, entrusted with his sons. The captain could barely recognize him, but then again, something in the back of her mind told her that she was truly seeing him for the first time. She'd heard the rumors, the whispers, the questions about how he never seemed to change over the years. She disregarded all of that now. He was the man who just saved her life. Nothing else mattered in war. She saluted. Sir, yes, sir. With a curt nod, Technoblade was off, merely a blur of color cutting a violent path across the valley, his trident flashing in the sunlight. A whimper caught the captain's attention. She turned back to the royal soldiers that she had been trying to rescue. Are you all right? She asked them. One of them, a fresh recruit she did not recognize, blubbered. Who the hell was that? That was your bloody general, she snapped. So you can stop cowering in your corner now. The blade has just joined the fight. Nice. Breaking the page. We got the breaking the page. The laughter was the worst of it. Wilbur could feel it growing louder in his head. The sound of a thousand different voices laughing at a joke he was not privy to. A joke with him as the punchline. But then the still healing wound on his hand would ache, reminding him of what he'd done and where he was. He was standing on a rock, feet braced against moss, feeling distant enemies with rows. He was with arrows. He was King Wilbur, protector of the realm, ruler of the kingdom, leader of the royal army. 
and he'd brought all these people here. And he was not going to let them down. He could spot Tommy's golden hair below him, clearing out the enemies that slipped by Wilbur's shots. He was good. Frighteningly good. He was easy to forget how it was easy to forget how capable Tommy was at destruction. He was so used to seeing Tommy lose against Techno that he'd have forgotten that against anyone else, Tommy was a force to be reckoned with all on his own. But that did not do much to dispel the worry tightening in Wilbur's gut. After all, he was, after all, also an older brother. Tommy launched himself at an incoming enemy, spear out. The enemy swung with his sword, but Tommy ducked just in time and swept his leg out to knock the man over. Tommy saw the spear pierce clean through and the body was still twitching on the ground before Tommy was swirling around to face another. This one didn't even get a meter near Tommy before Wilbur had put an arrow through, his, through their throat. Tommy rolled around and flashed Wilbur a grin. Not bad, Archer boy. Despite everything, Wilbur managed a small smile, a smile that slipped from his face when a sudden motion flick flickered in the corner of his vision. Tommy, watch out! Wilbur shouted, just as the enemy soldier barreled into Tommy. The two of them tumbled into the dirt, a tangle of limbs and blades. Wilbur fumbled for an arrow and found his quiver empty. Shit, he thought. Shit, the voices agreed happily. Hello, well. Wilbur hurriedly slung his bow over his shoulder and in the same breath unsheathed his twin rapiers from their scabbards. He dropped down from his perch, his teeth rattling on impact, the pain not registering because Tommy's in trouble. The enemy soldier had Tommy pinned to the ground, a sword raised over his head and ready to drop. Tommy was thrashing, desperately reaching for the spear that had been knocked out of his hand, but Wilbur was already kicking the enemy violently off of him. The enemy rolled across the ground, allowing Wilbur to stand between him and Tommy, the twin swords flashing menacingly in the flickering firelight. Get the fuck away from my brother, he hissed. How touching, the soldier said mockingly. He was different from the others, Wilbur could tell. He didn't know how exactly, but he just was. His eyes and hair were as black as coal, in stark contrast to the blood-stained white cloak he wore on his shoulder. On his shoulder. You, Wilbur said, brows furrowing. I saw you walk through the fire. How? The man scoffed. You think that little stunt could hurt me? He raised his blade. Upon closer inspection, it looked to be made of pure obsidian, pitch black all the way down to the hilt. I was born in fire. Are you the leader of this army? Wilbur demanded. He gave a short bark of laughter. Me? No, no. I'm merely a pawn in this game. A, ga a pawn with a grudge to settle. But still, a pawn nonetheless. He grinned. Now show me what he taught you, king. Wilbur didn't need to be told twice. He launched himself at the man, blue irises crunching beneath his feet. The swords met, and from there, it was a dance. Blades flashed as Wilbur began pushing the man backwards, but he was matching Wilbur hit for hit. Wilbur thrusted forward with his left sword, but, but the man dodged fluidly before swinging his sword in a mean arc that would have taken Wilbur's head clean off if he had not stepped backwards. From there, the man launched his offensive, striking from above, but Wilbur managed to cross his rapiers together and block the hit just in time. The blow reverberated down to Wilbur's bones, but the man gave him no time to recover, pushing his blade harder against Wilbur's. Wilbur dug his heels to the ground and parried, using the man's weight against him. He hoped it would cause the man to stumble and end this matter once for all, but instead, the man swung again, feigning another overhead strike before changing to a side hit at the last moment. Wilbur blocked the blow, but the force of it sent him crashing to the ground. The white cloaked soldier stood over him, a small smile playing on his lips. That was disappointing, he said, spinning his sword lazily between his fingers, as if he had all the time in the world. At the very least, I expected a man trained under a god of blood to, well, actually draw some. Wilbur froze. 
He glared up at the man standing before him, suddenly understanding. You're here for Tecna. The man stopped spinning his sword. I'm surprised he told you what he was. I must mean a lot. You must mean a lot to him. His smile was slow and cold. That makes this all the more fun. He raised his sword and brought it crashing down. Breaking a page. We got a breaking a page. Y'all, this is good. <laughs> this is getting good. Okay, um. I'm like, I'm like watching my phone like a hawk, I swear. Like, I do not want to miss. I don't want to miss the stream. I'm like, I got my eyes peeled. Quackity is streaming. He's doing a lore stream today. And I want to make sure that I do not miss it. Because if I miss it, I'm going to cry. Okay, he's not live yet. Okay, let's get back into it. It might have been hours. It might have been days. It might have even been between the space of one breath and another. Technoblade could no longer tell. More and more of enemy... More and more enemies were finding ways to breach the wall of fire. The royal army's archers were doing their best to snipe them down before they could join the fray. But they're... Hold on. Be right back. I'm sorry, y'all. My sister called me and, yeah, took me on my own. Dang. Oh. Let's get back into it. More and more of the enemy are finding ways to breach the wall of fire. The royal army's archers were doing their best to snipe them down before they could join the fray. But their dreadful lack of experience was beginning to show cracks were forming. They were nearing a breaking point. No, Techno thought, trying in one hand, a bone-handled chain whip in the other. Not if I can help it. He found himself in the thick of it, drawn not to the violence, but to the sounds of Wilbur's people, his people, calling for help. A god's help. Blood, the voices demanded. Blood for the blood god. But Techno didn't, but Techno didn't want blood. Not today. He wanted justice. Get down, he told the royal army soldiers that had gathered around him. Techno realized with a jolt that they had not come to him to ask for his protection, but to give him theirs, as if their fragile mortal bodies might make a difference when it came to him. Fools, he wanted to say. 
But all that came out was, On the ground! All of you, now! They were quick to comply. They dove into the weeds just as Techno lashed out with his whip. The heavy chain carved an arc through the air before finding its mark. Wrapping around the neck of an enemy soldier, Techno pulled sharply, knocking the soldier down. He shook the whip free and spun it around to hit an incoming enemy straight in the head. There was a sickening crunch as the force of the whip crushed bone. Ooh, before the body hit the ground, Techno spun the whip towards other targets, aiming for throats, temples, ankles, anything to pull or crush. He was standing in the eye of the storm, his whip cracking through the air like lightning. When the chain whip rattled back into his hands again, it was wet with blood. You can get up now, he told the soldiers that were staring dazedly up at him from the ground. Take care of the stragglers. What stragglers? One of them called out incre incredulously, incredulously, but Techno was already moving again. He launched himself into the air for a brief moment, flying weightlessly over the carnage, and then he crashed down with his trident, impaling a man to the earth. He pulled the trident out with a sickening squelch and then threw a throwing knife right into the eye of an approaching soldier. Another came running towards him, but he made quick work of them too. This was his element. This is where he belonged. More, the voices demanded. More, more, more. This was not his element. This was not where he belonged. He was under strict orders from the king to keep himself in check, and he would not falter now. And then he heard it. Techno could not explain how he heard it over the sounds of swords clashing and people dying and fires burning. It was as if his very soul had only been listening for that sound and nothing else. In the far distance, a scream. Breaking a page, you gotta break in a page, you gotta break in a page, you gotta break in a page. Okay, moving on. When he was a child, Tommy had tried to scale the side of the castle. He did not remember the fall, but he remembered the crash. He remembered the feeling of his bones splintering underneath him. The pain so blinding that he almost passed out. He didn't know who eventually found him, but he eventually woke up in his bedroom, his left arm in a sling, and Wilbur asleep by his bedside. Techno had been leaning against the far wall, glaring at him. He's been here for days, Techno had said. You really scared the shit out of him, Tommy. It was the angriest Techno had ever been at him, and that was the moment Techno under that Tommy understood that what he really meant, what he really meant, was that Tommy scared the shit out of them both. As the white cloaked man's sword broke through the shaft of Tommy's spear and into Tommy's shoulder, he remembered that pain and felt it a thresh, and felt it a thousandfold. He felt the blade break through his skin and embed itself in his collarbone, and there was only fire in his veins. Tommy! He felt Wilbur's hand pulling him back, and they both stumbled backwards. Tommy still clutching the broken ends of the spear he tried to shield Wilbur with. Tommy fell to his knees, the pain making everything go white. I'm going to pass out, he thought. I'm going to die. Little hero. The man grumbled as he approached them once again, the edge of his sword dripping with Tommy's blood. You're only delaying the inevitable. Now sit still as I put you down. Tommy? Wilbur's hands were on him, pressing against the wound. Tommy? Tommy, come here. I'll fix you. I'll fix you. Wilbur? Tommy croaked as the white cloaked man advanced. Wilbur, the enemy. Say your goodbyes, princeling. The man cackled, raising his sword one final time. Tommy grabbed Wilbur, even as his entire body trembled with the movement, covering his older brother's body with his own. He shut his eyes, waiting for the coup to, coup to grace. It never came. When Tommy looked back again, he found Technoblade standing over them, blocking the man's sword with his trident. Finally! The man growled, pushing against the shaft of Techno's trident. I have been waiting for you, you bloody bastard. Techno cocked his head to the side, considering the man at length. I... he said monotonously. Monotonously. 
don't know you. The man's eyes hardened. You killed them. You took them both away from me. And you don't even remember. He jumped back, cutting the air between them with his sword, splattering the ground by Techno's feet with Tommy's blood. That's alright. I'll just make you remember. Techno turned to look at Tommy and Wilbur, his expression carefully neutral. He took in Tommy's wound, Wilbur still frantically trying to suppress the blood flow. Techno. Techno's jaw clenched. Go. He turned back to his enemy, his braid whipping in the wind. Most of the morning glories were gone. Take care of your brother, Wilbur. What? Tommy, let's go, Wilbur said sharply. He began to pull Tommy over the to the mossy rock he'd been standing on. He leaned Tommy against it and bent and bent to the task of securing the gash on Tommy's shoulder. Uber ripped the end of his red and blue coat and began wrapping it around Tommy's shoulders. I can't see, Wilbur. Tommy protested, straining to look beyond. I can't see, Wilbur. Tommy protested, straining to look beyond Wilbur's head. You don't need to see that, Wilbur in insisted grimly, tightening the cloth around the wound. You don't want to see that. See what? Tommy demanded, his throat aching. When he had started, when had he started screaming? Wilbur, we need to help him. Before Wilbur could reply, there was a loud crack, like thunder, making them both flinch. Wilbur turned towards the sound, just enough for Tommy to catch a glimpse of the fighting over his shoulder, just enough for him to see Technoblade raise the man up by his collar and drive him straight into the ground, shattering the earth once more. Breaking a page, we got it, breaking a page. Okay. He was supposed to be dead. As Technoblade drove him against the dirt with enough force to crack it, he knew the man should have died the first time around. But he didn't. Instead, he merely grinned up at Technoblade with bloody teeth, his face drawn and cold and much to Techno's charge in. Completely earned arrogance. Ah, I see. Techno said with his hand around the man's throat. What's a god of war doing in a place like this? I would state the obvious, the man said calmly, gesturing to the bloodbath around them. But this is a purely personal affair. He kicked up, landing a hit on Techno's gut that launched him backwards. Techno's... Techno's... Techno braced himself against the dirt, unwilling to give the war god any more ground. Tommy and Wilbur were somewhere behind him, and that was all the reason Techno needed to pick up his triton again. The war god got unsteadily to his feet, then seemed to merely shake himself out of the experience of having his head cracked against the ground with the force of twenty rampaging bulls. He cracked the tension out of his neck and simply picked up his sword again. Now that we're properly acquainted, the war god said, let's take this more seriously, shall we? He moved quick, quicker than Techno expected. Techno barely managed to parry a blow aimed directly at his heart. Techno thrust out with his trident in retaliation, but the war god simply danced out of the way before returning again in full force. Techno took one of the knives from his bandolier and stabbed out. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Managing to nick the other god just barely before they clashed weapons again. Blow for blow, hit for hit, they could have gone on like that forever. A god of war and a god of blood. In another life, they might have been allies. Techno tried in vain to remember which of the many people he felled over the centuries had belonged to this man. But there were too many. A long line of ghosts he would spend the rest of his immortal life atoning for. Atoning? The voices laughed. What is there to atone for? Does a lion atone for killing the gazelle? Does the fire atone for burning? Techno jumped backwards and threw his knife, which the war god deflected easily with his sword. He threw another, which the war god dodged. Another, which stuck harmlessly into the earth. Techno reached for another and found his bandolier empty. This is futile, the war god said. Just put on your weapons and maybe, maybe... I'll give you the merciful death you never gave them. 
You fight and you struggle, but we both know how this ends. Mortals and their bloody games. There can only be one outcome, right? The war isn't over yet, Technoblade replied. The god of war smiled, his eyes drifting to something over Techno's shoulder. Are you sure about that? Techno looked behind him, his eyes finding Tommy and Wilbur first, crouched underneath a rock. Techno could not bring himself to linger on the rock on the look of fear on Tommy's face as he stared back at him. And he s so he continued searching the horizon for what had caught the war god's attention. His heart, what remained of it, sunk as he took in the thousands of enemy reinforcements flooding the Blue Valley. Oh my god. <laughs> Breaking a page. We have a breaking a page. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Oof. My heart is like. <laughs> oh man. Oh, okay, let's get back into it. Temple stood in the knee deep. Knee deep depth the waters of the river that cut through the valley. Once clear, we now ran red with blood. Friend or foe, it didn't seem to matter. They all bled the same. The river's current was tugging at him. It's alright, it seemed to say. You can let go now. Oh no. Oh no. And Tubbo wanted to. By gods, he wanted to more than anything. His quiver was empty of arrows. He'd lost his bow and sword in the chaos. All he had now was a dagger, its blade no longer than its hands and just as frail. His body left, his body felt like it had been fighting for weeks, but a glance at the sun high overhead t told him it had only been hours. Hours of senseless slaughtering his way through the fray. It was better when he still had arrows. When he could stand and shoot at distant enemies without thinking of them as people. When he'd resorted to using a sword. When he'd gotten close enough to see the fear in their eyes as his blade pierced through cloth, cloth and skin. When the blood had colored him crimson, it was suddenly, frighteningly real. Once he had wanted to see their enemies burn. Now, he just wanted it to be over. Tubbo looked up at the sound of shouting before him. Enemies were running through the wall of flames, cutting through the fire like one after like one after the other in an unending tide. The words reinforcements and too many and retreat echoed in Tubble's ears as the, as the breath was knocked out of him. He, he tightened his grip on his dagger and his enemy reinforced as the enemy reinforcements advanced, cutting down people who were too weak, too inexperienced, too tired to fight. People like Tubbo. They drew closer, an infinite army. Tubbo felt bile rise in his throat. Too many, too many, too many. He felt hot tears slipping down his cheeks. Too many, too many. He felt his fear and dread. He felt his fear and dread, like a physical weight almost driving him to his knees. Too many. In the end, Tubbo was not a hero, but he raised his dagger anyway. Breaking a page. Ow, my heart. After this chapter, I'm, I'm ending the <laughs> dig stream. <laughs> it's over, Tommy whispered. He leaned against his brother as they both looked over the valley at the enemies descending upon their army like a swarm of hawks. The pain in his shoulder was now a distant worry. It wouldn't kill him, but he knew death was coming for him regardless. Wilbur was very still. Wilbur, Tommy turned to his brother. You know I love you, right? The king gave him a sharp look. What the hell are you talking about? Tommy swallowed thickly, trying and failing to keep the tears in. I... I love you. I don't think I ever said it. But it's true. I figured, if it's my last chance... This is not your last chance, Wilbert snapped. His eyes darkening, he whirled around, facing Technoblade. His soul stood between them and the mysterious soldier. Techno! Techno glanced back at Wilbur. 
His expression shuddered. He did not look at Tommy. It's time, Wilbur called out. For a moment, Techno only stared, and then slowly, deliberately, he nodded. I'm sorry, Wilbur. What? Tommy demanded. What are you talking about? Wilbur did not reply. He wasn't even listening. Tommy could only watch as Wilbur untucked the blowing horn from his side and put it up to his lips mechanically, his eyes blank and staring at nothing at all. Wilbur? Tommy begged. Wilbur, what's going- Wilbur blew the horn. Breaking a page. She heard it. They all did. Heads snapped up at the sound of a war horn echoing through the valley. A low, sad sound like the beginnings of a funeral- as a funeral dirge, or the cry of a lone bird separated from its flock. The flower shopkeeper met the eyes of a woman across the field. A stranger, only familiar from brief, inconsequential meetings at the camp, but in that moment, they were kindred spirits, united in their determination. The sh shopkeeper nodded. The woman gave her a solemn salute. It was now or never. The shopkeeper glanced at the oncoming horde of enemies, butchering all that stood in their way. But the royal army was not fighting anymore. No. They were running. They threw down their weapons and ran back in the direction of the hill, stumbling over weeds and irises and vines of morning glories. The green army, outnumbering them ten to one, gave chase, unaware of what was coming. The shopkeeper took off, the rock in her pocket seeming to grow heavier with every step. But unlike the other, she was headed north, up one of craggy mountains that bordered the valley. She knew the others, at least those who were dead already, must have headed towards the other mountain, crashing through the trees and underbrush as she was. There was fifty of them in total, but only two of them were really needed for the job. If you lose heart, the king had said during the midnight meeting, for he played out his plans to the volunteers, just make sure someone else still has theirs. This is a last resort. But it might also be our only choice. He had told them all they were free to leave. None of them had. The rest of camp had all been told two things. When you hear the horn, run for your life. And don't tell Prince Tommy. The shopkeeper bounded over boulders and overgrowth, her heartbeat thundering in her ears. Hey! She risked the glance back she and found three green army soldiers running after her. They were less used to the terrain than she was. She walked, she'd walked, walked this path a million times over the past week, but they were gaining on her quick, their swords raised and ready. The shopkeeper kept running, but her knees were screaming, her lungs on the verge of collapse. She was tired, so tired. A yell came from behind her. She tried to ignore it until it came again. She glanced behind her once more, stopping dead in her tracks when she realized what was happening. One of the enemy soldiers was on the ground, a small dagger embedded in the nape of his neck. The other two were doubling back, facing the attacker that must have followed them up the forest. She caught sight of the brown hair. She caught sight of brown hair, a small frame. Oh God, it was the boy who lied his way into the enemy. Into the ar who lied his way into the army and had fought bravely in it until the very end. The shopkeeper glanced behind her to the cave where her main objective was. She was so close, but the boy she saw was unarmed. The decision was already made. She ran back down the mountain, her axe in her hand. The soldiers had cornered the boy against the tree, their blades ready to cut his life at 17 years, but that meant that their backs were to her. They never saw her coming. Just pretend. You're chopping down a tree, the general had taught them during the training phase at the castle. The axe will get the job done, but it will take a few swings. It only took her two. One through the neck, the other into the skull. Two soldiers dropped dead at her feet. The boy stared up at her, breathing heavily. His face streaked with blood and dirt. It looked as if he had aged fifty years in a day. The shopkeeper no longer recognized the boy foolhardy boy who'd run around camp doing the most menial chores. 
grinning from ear to ear and taking pride in being part of something bigger than himself. He was battered and bruised and bleeding with eyes so haunted the shopkeeper couldn't help but wonder about all the things he'd seen since the sun rose of the battlefield. What has this world done to you? She thought. But all she said was, Are you alright? The boy could only nod wordlessly. You need to get out of here, she said hurriedly, already hearing more soldiers coming from the mountain. Here, take this. She shoved her axe to his hand. The boy shook his head vigorously. I, I can't, he croaked. You need to protect yourself. She gave him a better smile. Trust me, kid. You need it more than I do. Now go. You know your orders. Back to the camp. Follow the sun. Before she could think better of it, she pulled the boy into her arms, hugging him tightly. For a moment, he could only stand in listless surprise, and then she felt his arms close around her. He buried his head into her shoulder and let out a single gut-wrenching sob. When the shopkeeper let go, there was a new spark in the boy's eyes. Faint, but better than nothing. The boy turned to go, but lingered at the tree line. What's your name? he asked. Nikki, he said. She said, My name is Nikki. I'll see you later, Nikki. And the boy, the boy said, and was gone. She stared after him for a while, her heart feeling lighter in a way she could not explain. But then a twig broke in the distance, heralding the arrival of enemy troops. The shopkeeper steeled herself one last time and headed for the cave. Inside, stacked from one end of the cave to another, connected to natural underground caverns that ran the length of, mount of the mountain, was the king's last resort. The only thing that stood between the kingdom and their in the certain doom. He gonna blow it up, huh? We will see our enemies burning, the king had promised them on the first day, lifetimes ago. It wasn't exactly burning, but blowing them to kingdom come was an acceptable compromise. The flint was in her hand. All she, all she could smell was sulfur and the distant scent of irises. Her, her pursuers were at the mouth of the cave, screaming as they realized what she was about to do. They might have begged. She would never know. Oh, I'll see you all in hell, she said bitterly, and struck the flint into flame. Oh. 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 Oh, that's what he meant by the telling the volunteers, you can go if you don't want to do this. Like, you're giving your life for this. You know, uh, you know what, you know what. That means. Breaking a page. At the summit of the opposite mountain in a cave almost identical, the captain did the same. For my kingdom, she whispered into the empty cave and let the fire fall. Breaking a page. Nikki hoped, at the very least, that they would plant the prettiest flowers over her grave. Breaking the page. The explosions rocked the world. It rattled the very sun from its loyal orbit. Uber braced himself against the rock he'd once stood fiercely on and watched the mountains fall. Yes, the voices chorused. This was always meant to be. Uber had been here before. He'd dreamt it. He'd lived it. As an avalanche of rocks and earth cascaded into the valley, crushing anyone unfortunate enough to be left behind, friend or foe, Uber felt a tug of familiar... A familiar familiarity at his core. His ears rung from the violence of it all. The voices, the screaming, the blasts that went on and on and on. Flocks of birds soared up into the sky, disturbed from their perches. They were the only survivors. Oh. When the dust settled, all Wilbur could see was a pile of devastation where the Blue Valley used to be. Their armies, crushed by the th thousands, are buried alive on Wilbur's orders. Their allies... Wilbur bent over the ground and vomited. Wilbur? Wilbur's ears were still ringing. He heaved at the last of his stomach's contents, coughing up blood and spittle. There was no end to it. Wilbur! Uber turned, almost afraid of what he would find behind him. Tommy, his face pale, his eyes wide and staring, as if he'd never seen Wilbur before. 
Tommy, Wilbur croaked. Stop looking at me like that. Look away. Look away. Look away. What? Tommy's voice was so small. What the... What did you just do? Breaking a page. Breaking a page. Gotta break a page. What did he do? The war dot the war god demanded. He tried moving towards the king and the prince, but Techno was there, forever blocking his way. Don't take another step. Techno raised his trident. Its prongs aimed towards the war god's chest. Your army is gone. There's nothing left to fight for. You bastard! The god growled, his obsidian sword trembling in his grip. You think this hurts me? I died years ago. Techno took a deep breath, his hand still reeked of sulfur. Come then, he said exhaustedly. Blood for the blood god. I shall kill you again. The war god jumped towards him, starting the cycle anew. You said no more secrets! Tommy's nails dug bloody crescents to his palm. You promised, Wilbur! They were all dead. They were all dead because of the man that Tommy couldn't bear to call his brother. He wanted to dig into his skin and rip out every part that was Wilbur's. He wanted to gut himself, tear it all apart from the inside out. If that was what it took to get rid of the screaming in his head, Wilbur wasn't meeting his eyes. Tommy marched up to him and grabbed him roughly by the collar. Look at me! Tommy screamed. The ground was still shaking, or maybe it was just him. Hot tears spilled down his cheeks, tears of a rage too big for his body. How long have you been planning this? Was it from the beginning? Did you look our people in the eyes and never bother telling them you were leading them to a slaughterhouse? Some of them had to have survived. Wilbur whispered, his words almost lost to the wind. I warned them. Tommy shook him violently. That's not the point, he sobbed. Wilbur finally looked at him, but there was nothing behind his dark eyes. I had to do what I had to do, Tommy, was all he said. Tommy shoved him viciously away. His hands felt dirty. He felt unclean. In his head, he could still hear the strings of a lonely guitar playing over the soft laughter of soldiers that were now simply gone. Gone in a flash. Between one breath and the next, it had come so easily to Wilbur. Would it come easily to Tommy, too? You messed up, Tommy spat. You messed up, Wilbur. Tommy. Wilbur reached out for him, but Tommy flinched back. Don't touch me! Breaking the page. Be right back, guys. Okay, okay, okay. I had to set up for Quackity's stream. Uh, I, I'm going to, to finish reading this chapter. And I'm actually going to go ahead and I'm going to end the stream so that I can watch Quackity's stream, his lore stream. It's going to be exciting. If you want to watch it, go to Quackity on Twitch. Uh, I believe there's about eight minutes left before the stream actually starts. So I'm going to go ahead and finish this and then we're going to end for right now. And I will actually finish reading the rest of Passerine. Um, I'm going to finish in reading it by myself, and then I'm going to do a reaction video to the animatic afterwards. And then I'm going to upload this VOD to YouTube. And if people want me to finish reading it out loud, I will come back and I will finish reading the other uh, three chapters later on. Okay, let's get back into it. 
Uber finally looked at him, but there was nothing behind his dark eyes. I did what I had to do, Tommy, was all he said. Tommy shoved, his, shoved him viciously away. His hands felt dirty, he felt unclean. In his head, he could still hear the strings of a lonely guitar playing over the soft laughter of soldiers that were now simply gone. Gone in a flash between one breath and the next. It had come so easily to Wilbur. Would it come easily to Tommy too? You messed up, Tommy spat. You messed up, Wilbur. Tommy, Wilbur reached out for him. But Tommy flinched back. Don't touch me! Breaking a page. In battle, when two opponents were evenly matched in strength and wisdom and anger, it would only take one thing to bring it all down. One soldier, one mistake, one move. The war god had seen this far his fair share of battles and had won all of them except one. The only battle to matter, and he'd lost everything because... A blood god had decided to throw his lot in with the opposing forces. One soldier. Afterwards, the war god had dragged himself through the battlefield, his throat burning from screaming his lover's name into the quiet sky. When he'd found him, the war god had crawled towards his broken body, curling around it as if he could somehow warm it back to life. But he had stayed there for years, letting the moss and the weeds grow over the two of them. He would have stayed there forever, beside the carcass rotted down to the bone, but a fire had grown inside of him, a fire that would not be satiated until he had the head of the god that had taken everything from him. Now here he was, facing off against the very culprit. It was a bloody dance. The war, the war god slashed and the blood god parried. The blood god lunged at, and the war god ducked like the push and pull of the tides drawn to each other by a gravity of violence. But all the war god needed, he knew, was a single chance. He would not waste it. Don't touch me! The words were of the high-pitched shriek, shriek of a frightened child, a familiar sound on a battlefield, indistinguishable from every scream that came before it. But the blood god turned towards it, leaving his defenses completely open. One mistake. The war god raised his sword high above his head. It was very difficult to kill a god, but not impossible. In the right hands, like the hands of a warrior, with fire in his heart and carnage in his smile, it would only take one blow. Goodbye, blood god, he thought. My vengeance is complete. Technoblade instinctively... Technoblade turned instinctively at Tommy's scream. Just in time to see Tommy draw back from Wilbur's reaching hand. Pain flashed across Wilbur's face. Okay, I'm just checking the time. Four minutes. <laughs> Te a shadow fell over Technoblade, and by the time he remembered where he was, it was too late. Oh, I skipped something. Pain flashed across Wilbur's face, but he was otherwise unscathed. Both of them were safe. No knives in their backs, no arrows through their, through their throat. The th shadow fell over Technoblade. And by the time he remembered where he was, it was too late. Technoblade turned and faced the tip of a bloody sword, a breath away from his face. But it was not the war god's obsidian blade coming to reap his soul. It was a familiar silver broadsword pierced through, pierced right through the war god's chest. Technoblade could only stare as war, as war god, as the war god looked down at the blade and bit it straight through his heart. His sword arm still raised in what would have been a killing blow. Instead, the obsidian sword fell harmlessly out of his limp hold and onto the dirt, and the war god followed close behind. Behind him stood a winged man, his golden hair catching the rays of the setting sun. No, the voices screamed. Not you, not you, not you! Hello, Techno, said Filza. Ooh, breaking the page is getting good. Okay. Wilbur saw him first. Perhaps that was how it was always meant to be. Some part of him would always unfla unfailingly be looking for him. Tommy followed a beat later. Wilbur saw his brother's shoulders go slack, like a marionette with its strings suddenly cut. Dad? Their father was standing before Technoblade. 
and the unmoving body of the white-cloaked soldier. At the sound of Tommy's voice, he turned and looked at his son for the first time in a decade. And so he enters the scene once more, the voices whispered. Before Rupert could say anything, Tommy was already running. Brick in a page. One move. That was all it would take. On the ground beside him was one of the blood gods throwing knives. Lost during their battle, with the last of his strength, he curled his fingers around the hilt. His love was calling him home. He could hear it in the warmth wind, in the warm wind, but he could not face him before he was avenged. And so, with all he had left, the war god aimed, and he threw. Dad! His father was here! His dad, standing among the blue irises, the same shade as his sad eyes. The years fell away like smoke, and Tommy was a boy again. There was no explosion, there was no war, there was no leaving, there was only a son and his father. Tommy felt a hysterical laugh bubble out of him as he ran, even as his cheeks still stung with tears. There was everything. There was confusion, there was grief, there was anger, there was relief, there was disbelief, there was joy. Dad! Tommy shouted, spreading his arms wide as he ran, like a bird about to take flight. Tommy... Dad's smile was still the same. After all these years, he opened his arms, welcoming Tommy into his into an embrace. Into an embrace. My boy, you've grown so much. And then there was pain, as the knife found its mark in the prince's heart. Breaking a page. Tommy watched Tec Techno watched Tommy fall backwards, impossibly slow. It took a moment for the reality to sink in, and by then, Wilbur was screaming, screaming so loud it drowned out everything else, even the voices that began screeching inside Techno's head. Tommy! Filza shouted, running towards Tommy's unmoving body, but Wilbur was already there, cradling his brother to his chest. Techno could only watch, utterly numb, utterly cold, utterly lost inside his own head. No, 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 this couldn't be happening. This could not be happening. It was over. The war was over. He'd done everything he could to protect him, to protect Tommy. Why was this... Why was this still how it ended? This is what it feels like, someone gasped. To lose everything. By the time Techno turned around, the war god ready to rip him limb from limb, he was dead. A smile on his face. Read that how you want. <laughs> no! Wilbur's scream brought him violently back to his body, the force of Comet crashing onto Earth. Me! Techno staggered towards them. His. Okay. God, the stream is starting. Okay, we, we still got time. It's almost done. Techno staggered towards him, his blood as heavy as lead, his vision hazy, but he could see the one thing that mattered. His Tommy, lying so still in his brother's arms. His Tommy, who braided his hair with sweet smelling flowers. His Tommy, who was quick to anger, but quicker to laugh. His Tommy. The sun was setting over the blue valley. There was a terrible, terrible silence. The kind of silence that always came before something de devastating, the calm before the storm. Tommy had always hated silences. It gave his mind too many spaces to fill with darkness, so he brought light instead. Noise and laughter and jokes and jibes, anything to keep the quiet at bay. Wuber had helped with the weight, like he promised, but now it was back, pressing against Tommy's chest, suffocating him under its burden. There was pain, so much pain. He thought he'd already felt pain, but when did he truly know? He was only 15. Tommy felt himself lifted into someone's arms, the arms of the man that had snuffed out the lives of two armies in one fell swoop. Tommy, Tommy wanted to push him away again, to spit his anger and his, his disgust. Oh no, I'm missing, I'm missing the stream, I'm so sad. <laughs> Okay, um, I'll be right back. 